When we think of geopolitics, when we look at our neighborhood, it's natural to first think of Pakistan. India and Pakistan have been in conflict since these nation states existed. It may be a hard conflict to resolve. It may even be an impossible conflict to resolve. But it is a conflict we understand. We get the motivations on either side. We know where the roots of this conflict lie. We know both the what and the why. We also know the limits of our engagement. But we know none of this about our relationship with China. Are India and China friends or enemies? Are we engaged more in combat or more in cooperation? Do the two sides look at this as a zero-sum game or a positive-sum game, a win-win situation? What do the Chinese want from us? What do we want from them? Do we even know what we want from them? These are important questions to understand, especially because China is way more powerful than us in every possible sense. And while there was relative peace between India and China in the decades since the 1962 war, things have been heating up in the last few years. This is a problem. And before we solve it, we have to understand it. Welcome to The Seen and the Unseen, our weekly podcast on economics, politics and behavioral science. Please welcome your host, Amit Barma. Welcome to The Seen and the Unseen. My guest today is a remarkable scholar, Kanti Bajpai, whose new book is called India vs. China, Why They Are Not Friends. I've done many episodes on China before, including a deep dive into the history of our interactions. So when I first started reading Kanti's book, I didn't imagine I would find much that was new in it. But I did. This lucid and insightful book does the one thing that I enjoy in non-fiction books. It gets meta. Specifically, this book builds a frame through which we can examine the India-China relationship. It's built around what he terms the four P's. Perception, perimeters, partnerships and power. If you find China to be a bit of a mystery and don't quite understand the contours of this conflict then this book is for you. But Kanti and I don't only talk about the book. I love delving into the personal and intellectual journey of my guests. And Kanti had tons of insight for me about academia, being a public intellectual, how one learns, why it is important to forget the inessential, how writing and teaching make you a better thinker, and so on. There's tons of dope in this conversation. But before we get to it, let's take a quick commercial break. Long before I was a podcaster, I was a writer. In fact, chances are that many of you first heard of me because of my blog India Uncut, which was active between 2003 and 2009 and became somewhat popular at the time. I loved the freedom the form gave me and I feel I was shaped by it in many ways. I exercised my writing muscle every day and was forced to think about many different things because I wrote about many different things. Well, that phase in my life ended for various reasons and now it is time to revive it. Only now, I'm doing it through a newsletter. I have started the India Uncut newsletter at indiauncut.substack.com where I will write regularly about whatever catches my fancy. I'll write about some of the themes I cover in this podcast and about much else. So please do head on over to indiauncut.substack.com and subscribe. It is free. Once you sign up, each new installment that I write will land up in your email inbox. You don't need to go anywhere. So subscribe now for free. The India Uncut newsletter at indiauncut.substack.com. Thank you. Kanti, welcome to The Seen and the Unseen. Thank you very much. It's great to be here. Yeah, I'm, I'm uh, honored to have you here. And also, uh, uh, like I start my episodes uh, generally uh, delving deeper into a, per, uh, you know, a person's uh, journey right from where they went to school, uh, which in your case is interesting because uh, you ended up becoming a headmaster when you went to school. But, uh, you know, before I go back into the distant past, how have the last few months been for you? Like Singapore's been on a sort of a trajectory of its own. And right now it seems to have coped with it really well compared to uh, many others. And, uh, you know, there was this recent announcement by the Singapore government that, hey, we are just going to treat this as endemic uh, after a certain point in time and and not do contact tracing and quarantine and uh, all of that. But quite apart from that aspect of it, personally, how, how has this time been for you where you can't go out so much and you teach and I guess you can't talk to students so much, uh, you can't uh, interact physically with other scholars, you actually written a book during this period in uh, uh, some kind of isolation, I'm guessing. Uh, what has it been like? Well, actually, I mean, I'm glad you asked that because I think this book would never have got written if I hadn't had the lockdown or semi-lockdown. And the fact that it came along at a certain time uh, and coincidentally, Juggernaut Books approached me to write the book. 
Um, I'm quite disciplined, but I think if I don't get a smart kick in the pants and in an environment where there's pressure on me, uh, very long pieces of writing, I tend to start bracketing them and putting them aside. I write a lot of uh, chapters in books and uh, try and publish in journals. But those are, you know, fairly short pieces. This was supposed to be 50,000 words and it ballooned in my hands to about 75,000 words. And I think Juggernaut got quite nervy about the whole thing. But I think I needed the discipline or the semi-lockdown environment where there, we weren't completely stopped from, from moving out. By July of last year, when I began this, uh, we could go to restaurants. There was hybrid teaching. I could go out uh, shopping and so on and so forth uh, and under certain conditions even see a movie. But in fact, it became quite complex to do all of that and rather artificial and sometimes stressful uh, because you're worried about being infected. Oddly enough, ironically, the, the COVID contributed to my uh, staying parked at home uh, within these four walls in the small study and banging the book out. So I would say, you know, this, the kind of collateral of it for me was that it concentrated the mind wonderfully. And I just banged out the book in three months. Uh, I have a bit of a library. You know, my kids always say, you buy so many books. What do you do with all of them, Dad? And partly, I mean, I do read all of them. But I bank them. I bank them for when I will need to reach for that volume, when I need to uh, check a fact or a perspective. And of course, the internet writes to your rescue. So even though I couldn't get to the library um, and discuss things with colleagues all that much on the book, I could always turn to uh, Professor Google, who had lots of information and ideas for me. And so that's how the book uh, got written, really. So, you know, we'll take a digression here before we go to your history and talk about the act of writing and researching because, you know, when I uh, picked up this book of yours, which by the way, I, I love reading so uh, enlightening and uh, so lucidly written. You know, when I picked it up, my assumption was I haven't read anything else by you except maybe columns here and there. But then I realized that uh, one of your earlier books, uh, The Roots of Terrorism, which I think you wrote in the early 2000s, I had actually read that while researching for a review I wrote of Alan Kruger's book on what makes a terrorist. And I realized that I did not remember anything of your book or in fact of Kruger's book. And also I have done a, a number of episodes on China in the past. And I realized that while reading your book and taking notes and all of that, that there was very little I remembered of them either. And this is something I find as I'm coming into middle age that, you know, one may read a lot and one may try to absorb a lot of knowledge, but it's one you forget. And obviously by osmosis, you know, some, you know, you, the frame of how you think about things and the way you look at the world might be affected by osmosis in ways you don't consciously realize. But nevertheless, you forget so much, you lose so much. Um, so in your case, you know, do you have any ways of, uh, for example, doing knowledge management, trying to, uh, you know, make, make sure you assimilate all the information that you take in, all the books that you read? Tell me a little bit about, you know, how you do your knowledge management. And after that, you know, we can discuss how you go about writing a book. Actually, you know, you made an important point, which you phrased a bit uh, pejoratively in the sense that you said, well, you know, uh, I tend to forget. But actually forgetting is a rather important way of, of managing uh, knowledge. I think the brain partly automatically does it. If it's not terribly telling stuff, your brain uh, edits it out. Uh, it doesn't stay in long-term memory. And that's useful because otherwise uh, you would be filled with all kinds of stuff that you really don't need. And what you do, uh, the space you need to uh, process uh, more recent uh, readings and, and knowledge uh, would kind of degrade or be compromised. So I think a good part of knowledge management, in fact, is uh, creative or, or periodic forgetting. And so I'm quite comfortable with that. I mean, I think partly... I just feel if I need something which has now disappeared from my uh, memory banks, um, I'll just reach for the book or go back to the computer. Um, the other strategy, of course, is that I think periodically as I read, I do kind of do a tick mark to myself mentally, which is to say, what is the value add of this? I mean, is it does it just reinforce stuff that I already know pretty well, in which case it's dismissible, forgettable? But if it offers something that's somewhat different, then I think I tick it off in my brain and it at least it stays as a kind of gestalt, you know, a kind of uh, a quick picture uh, or an image that remains in my brain of a value add that came from a book. I mean, take an example in my field and it's referenced in the book. 
Uh, you read so much, but recently, 10 years ago, let's say, I think we all encountered Joseph Nye, the Harvard uh, political scientist's idea of soft power. And I mean, I don't bother to remember every argument he made about soft power, but basically the concept of soft power, how it differed from other forms of power remained. And I just tick marked it, didn't make much use of it, to be honest, until it came to this book. And uh, so I, I had one of his books. Uh, I looked, uh, I refreshed my memory quickly on some of the details related to it. And I think that's how I manage it. I try to consciously tick mark a value add without uh, stressing myself about remaining every, every twist and turn in the tail. And I think that's probably what happened with you with my earlier book, which you probably said, hmm, something here, but I'm not sure it really necessarily advances the cause tremendously. And I think your brain quite rightly just ticked it off uh, as something that you wouldn't really need to, to preserve. And to be honest, I'm not sure I could summarize that book any longer very well either. All the bits and pieces of it are now seeping back in now that you've mentioned it. No, I, I think you're being too harsh on your book and too kind on my brain because I tend to forget too much. I came across this really nice cartoon a couple of days ago where uh, a man is basically asking his wife, hey, what's the password to our computer? And she says, it's our anniversary. And, you know, so he's forced to remember it. So I think a lot of wives, uh, including perhaps mine, uh, listening to this will will be like, oh, that's why he forgets. It's not <laughs> important. But, so uh, do you use any technology or stuff uh, for taking notes and all of that? Because, like earlier, what I would do is I would take copious notes in Microsoft Word, for example, when researching for an episode or something I was writing. But it would just be a long, linear a collation of text and now I use something called Rome Research which you know has nested entries bi-directional linking it becomes much easier to kind of uh, categorize and search for keywords within everything that you've ever done and all of that so do you feel that there is a need for that or do you feel that no you know whenever you get down to writing something you kind of broadly know that oh I need to read this and this and this and then you go and do that yeah I'm the old-fashioned kind so um, and I'm a hypocrite lector I mean I tell my students uh, please use technology. Please be very assiduous about taking notes uh, when I'm speaking or others are speaking, when you read uh, and all of that. Uh, but myself, I'm I'm a hopeless note taker. I either slavishly write down every single thing that somebody says or that I've underlined when I first uh, scan a book or a piece of writing um, and I can't see the woods for the trees or I'm so lazy that I just give up completely and hope uh, that if it's interesting enough, stuff will stay in my brain, as I said earlier, as a kind of gestalt, uh, an image, or that little bits and pieces will remain, and I'll go back to the source when I need it, like you say. When I need it, I'll go back to the source, take notes. Even then, I'm a pen and paper uh, kind of guy, and so I will just uh, uh, yank out my little pad and, and pen and uh, take horrible scribbly notes. And in fact, technology has undermined me because I've got so used to working on a keyboard now that I can hardly you know, handwrite anymore. And often when I do my notes, I can't even, I can't make sense of my own notes. So I go along. As I write, I have a broad sense of where I'm going. And I, I write quite sort of uh, ambitiously. I make assertions. And then I start to go back and look at whether the evidence really bears out what I'm saying and do I need to modify it. You made an aside and I'll make an aside based on that. And your aside was that technology has kind of undermined your habit of taking handwritten notes and so on. And, uh, you know, I, I teach an online writing course. And then after one of the webinars of that recently, uh, one of the participants asked me an interesting question, which got me to thinking because I hadn't really thought about it. And her question was that is what you write different or is it shaped by whether you are typing it on a keyboard and, uh, you know, actually handwriting it by pen. And at one level, obviously, the answer is no, because words are words. And I've always held that, you know, for me, for example, a book is a words an author writes, everything else is packaging. So whether I'm holding a physical book or a Kindle, the words are words. But on the other hand, if you, you know, look at the way that you write, like there are some people, there'll be videos on YouTube about how you can type as fast as you think. And uh, the act of writing physically on paper is much slower. And therefore, you would imagine that your thinking also has to slow down to match the pace of your writing when you're writing by hand. And that may change the form of your thinking. Now, I don't know in what way and I'm kind of thinking aloud, you know, maybe it brings some kind of terror off to your thinking and helps it. Maybe it harms it because you're not, uh, you know, you're going along sl slower than you would. Uh, but since you just mentioned your habit of writing by hand and how technology has undermined it, I thought I'd bring it up and see if you have any thoughts. 
Yeah, you know, I've gone through a strange, uh, although perhaps others have as well, but a strange kind of transition. I began by saying what most people say, I guess of my generation or somewhat uh, younger, uh, which is that I could only compose uh, by writing longhand with pen and paper. And then I used to uh, type it in the old days when there were typewriters. I couldn't compose in a typewriter. And then when computers came, again, I wrote longhand. I remember most of my PhD initially was written by longhand uh, back in the uh, 80s. And then I tapped it all out uh, on a computer. And I just couldn't com- think and compose properly unless I did it longhand. Now I've got to the point where it's the reverse. I really can't do the handwriting. I can take notes handwriting. I can't really take notes typing stuff out, but I I, I can only take notes uh, handwritten. On the other hand, I can't now compose coherent text handwriting. My arm hurts, uh, it gets squiggly, and I like now the, the, the white screen or the slightly yellow screen I like the clickety-click of uh, the keyboard. You know, I bought one of those clackety, uh, old-fashioned keyboards, which are now newfangled keyboards, because I like the clickety-click and the pushback from the keys. So there was something tactile and uh, noisy that I need now as a feedback or as a feeling when I compose. And I must say, so it's reversed for me. Um, I do much better when I type out the text originally and then just use handwritten notes as a supplement. So that's where I am. And you've written uh, so many books. You're a prolific columnist and essayist and so on. You know, you mentioned the white screen, which often to me is like the white screen of death because so often I will, you know, sit down to write and it'll just be a struggle. And that clickety-clack of the keyboards, which you mentioned, is what I aspire to. But I'm just sitting there and there's a white screen. And uh, obviously there are, uh, you know, various hacks writers have to beat this. And um, I myself, when I teach my writing course, perhaps a little hypocritically because I don't know my own struggle so well, I, I tell them about how you know most of the act of writing is just getting your butt on the chair and just actually getting the work done tell me a little bit about your working habits because uh, you know when one writes initially I guess there are one has to deal with the anxieties of what other people will think of your writing and when you're a young scholar you want to impress others and you have to get past that and that can sometimes come in the way later on you have to handle things like the curse of knowledge where uh, you know you you know so much that you assume that is you know is this even worth writing but surely everybody knows it am I stating the obvious you know which I would imagine will happen to anyone in any field when they are so deep into it that everything seems common knowledge to them so what's kind of your work ethic like? What are the problems you have faced in your writing life? Like if one looks at your body of work, it's incredibly impressive and one imagines that, oh, Mr. Bajpai just sits down and he just uh, hammers out uh, book after book. But it, that's never the case, right? So tell me about the kind of problems you faced, how you overcome them and what your work ethic is like. Like the, writing this book, for example, during the pandemic, you knocked it off in three months. You've, I think you mentioned that in, uh, you know, in your episode with Milan Vaishnav on Grand Tamasha, uh, which I'll link from the show notes. So, uh, you know, is that kind of your normal process or is the normal process a little more drawn out and stuff? Yeah, you know, I think that um, I need to get going quickly. And if I postpone writing too much, if I think it over too, too much, then uh, it slows me down. It paralyzes me a bit. I think when I was an undergraduate in Canada and, and a bit thereafter, I had this kind of sense that you really have to develop a full outline, fill in the, the subsectors of, of virtually every section. And then when you've got a grand scheme set up almost on a board in front of you with connective sort of lines and vectors and got it all figured out, that's when you really get going. And you write very carefully, uh, very systematically proceeding from A to B and end up at Z. And uh, I think as an undergrad in one paper, I remember particularly in my English literature class, urged on by a, a, a friend of mine, a girlfriend of mine at the time, I tried to follow that. I got the most miserable grade I ever got. And I just had a kind of moment there where I realized that I don't work that way. I have to kind of get into it and then amend and edit and change. And, and the faster I get to it, uh, the more likely I'm, I'm to do something a bit more original and actually finish it and, and probably uh, do a fairly polished product. And when I got to grad school, I somewhat, that is for my PhD in, in America, I somewhat went back to that idea that I had to 
get everything worked out in total before I began to write anything. And then I remember that there was a moment, well, partly under the stress of writing so much in American grad school, you couldn't quite afford to do that. But I remember a, a moment when it got to my thesis where I was still somewhat struggling with, you know, these different models. And my late supervisor, now late supervisor, Steve Cohen, uh, who was remarkably productive, uh, saying to me, look, Kanti, you'll never finish the PhD if you don't figure out how to proceed, uh, you know, efficiently. And he said, what I can teach you is not the substance of what you're going to write, but how to get this thing done. It's a finite task. You'll never write something that is the definitive work for all time. That's not how knowledge works. So throw that out of the window. Don't be a perfectionist. Write what you know quickly and hard and fast. Don't stop writing. If you get stuck in one section, move on to the, the next one. Write every day. Don't lose the momentum. Uh, write ungrammatically. Write dot points. Write uh, fluently and floridly when things are going well. You'll have to come back to those to edit and, and you know, amend. Because what looks wonderful on Monday begins to look terrible on Wednesday. And be prepared to do that. And finally, he said, you know, when you got something done and you're reasonably happy with it, put it away in a drawer for uh, at least a week, if it's a substantial piece of writing, come back to it. In the meantime, go on to something else. And, you know, looking at his example and how productive he was, and he wrote brilliantly as well, I just decided I've got to give that a try. Plus, of course, you know, he said, if you don't give me the first chapter in the next week, uh, you're out of this program. So, I mean, I think, you know, uh, the prospect of a hanging concentrates your mind wonderfully, uh, as Johnson said, and I wrote it in a week. And after that, I think I never looked back. By the way, I should say, you're very kind. I uh, haven't written that many books at all. Uh, in fact, one of the stains on my record is that uh, I, I co-wrote one book. The book you very kindly mentioned on Roots of Terrorism was written likewise in about four weeks in a fellowship in Australia. And this one was written in three months. I've edited a lot of books and I've written chapters for books of other people and so on. But I'm a bit of a lazy guy uh, that way. I mean, uh, I need someone to really push me and slap me around and uh, kick me uh, in the pants. And I write a lot for friends. So if an academic friend says, oh, give me a chapter on this or write uh, a piece for that, or even this book, Nandini Mehta, who was an old friend, Ad Juggernaut said, come on, Kanti, I've asked you a couple of times, write this book quickly. Uh, it's time. And I wouldn't say I did it out of a sense of obligation, but I did it out of a sense of friendship and not wanting to let her down one more time. So, you know, I'm a bit of an externally driven writer. If you uh, get me by the throat and shake me up a bit and and shame me, I'll I'll write. And and that's pretty much uh, the problem I face as well. Right? If I have a deadline to give a column by, I'll give it. But if I have to be like internally driven, it's a bit of a problem. Though I, I you know, I keep telling my students obviously about the, you know, the constant trade-off that everything involves between getting it done and getting it right. And my point always is when it comes to the first draft, you have to get it done. You know, getting it right is something that you do in subsequent edits and so on. Now, I'm also intrigued by the notion that you moved away from the thought that you have to have everything figured out before you write. And I'm reminded of this quote by the economist Deidre McCloskey, when she said, quote, don't wait until the research is done to begin writing because writing is a way of thinking. Research is writing, stop quote. Her italics, uh, she italicized is, research is writing. Now, to what extent does writing and also teaching actually help your thinking with the subject? Like one of the things I liked about this book and that, you know, contributed to its lucidity was that there's a very very clear framework through which you are looking at India-China relations, you know, the four P's as it were, which we'll talk about in detail. You know, do you kind of begin with a framework? Does that sort of framework or the way of looking at a problem, the getting meta about a problem as it were, emerge while teaching, while writing, and then you flesh it out? And do you think for that reason that those who write more will inevitably be better thinkers than those who write less? Because writing forces you to think that much more clearly and that much more deeply. Yeah, I think you've raised a lot of interesting uh, issues there. For me, I mean, with this book, uh, I know we'll get to it, but just in terms of the process, the, the publisher said, you know, write something that's for a general audience, first of all. So don't have a big, complicated theoretical framework 
that leads you into the subject and informs it and so on. But on the other hand, I realized that, you know, what I would end up with as a result then might be just a long list of topics. And there are many things that are missing in the book. The river water problem, Pakistan as an issue between India and China, trade and financial relations between the countries. And they were all there in my original list. And I think Juggernaut Books probably hoped that some of those would all be addressed in, in the book. But I realized fairly early on that I would just have a list and I would knock off all these topics. For instance, also the whole issue of India, China in different regions, Southeast Asia, South Asia, Africa, Latin America. And, you know, first of all, I, I wouldn't meet the, the wordage. But secondly, it would just be a list. And so it seems to me that one of the things we're trained in in academic life, particularly, is you've got to try and develop some kind of an argument. And that can come from two places, although I think they're kind of linked. One place uh, you get your winnowing out of ideas is uh, you go to theory and you sort of say, well, what would theory expect us to think about uh, in terms of the India-China relationship, uh, why they're in conflict, uh, why do they occasionally cooperate? And there are some answers there, obviously, from international relations theory. The other way is, the other source of, uh, of, of, of a sort of framework is to be a bit more inductive, a bit more playful. From what you know, if you're immersed in, in the area that you're going to write about, um, you kind of throw up a, a set of topics, start to sort of group them and categorize them, and see whether something emanates from that. Now, pure methodologists in academic life will tell you, never do that. You know, uh, induction can never leave you to not lead you to knowledge. But I think that's hogwash. Uh, and I think there's a, actually a dialectic between the two. Uh, nobody is tabula rasa. We bring some theoretical assumptions, perspectives, arguments always to bear, because in a complex world, you wouldn't see the woods for the trees. I, uh, you couldn't put one foot forward uh, in front of the other, unless you had a theory of walking and where you're going. So you need some proto-theory, and we always already have it. But you also need to be a bit playful, and you're always receptive to experience, the empirical test. Things are bubbling around you, and they impact on your sense experience, they modify your theory. So in, in this book, and in a lot of writing, I think I do what my supervisor did as well. He would say to me, just chuck out a bunch of initial the uh, ideas that you have, a set of topics, literally spread them out on the page with your pen and paper, your computer, and then start to sort of cohere them into boxes, into categories. And he always quoted, I think, Aristotle to me saying, you know, Aristotle said that the first move in science is to put things in boxes. And I'm sure, you know, Indian forms of knowledge and so on uh, would probably give you some similar, very uh, sensible advice. And for me, I think I do go with that. I've got some working ideas. I don't work at them too much. I don't develop them too much. And then I throw out literally sort of uh, a bunch of words on a piece of paper. And then I begin to cohere them. And I began to think what kind of boxes are them and linkages between them. And how many of these can I really handle how much of these make for some coherence? What will I have to throw out? Where is it too much work and I'm simply not expert enough and it's not the kind of area I should delve into, otherwise I'd make a fool of myself, you know? Um, and I think that's how the four Ps emanated and throughout a bunch of topics, I reworked stuff that uh, Juggernaut had kind of uh, pushed at me and uh, the four Ps kind of popped up. And I tried to give them some clothing uh, to link them up a bit more conceptually back with my discipline. Juggernaut didn't like it very much. They said it was a bit too much for the general reader. We had a friendly disagreement, but you know, ultimately for a general readership, I think their instinct was correct. And so I didn't elaborate these four Ps and where they come from very much. I could probably do that if you push me, or even if you don't, and say a little bit about why I think they are the, the four important areas. And so I think that's that's how I operate in, in my writing. One other thing that you touched on, which is quite nice, is, and one that I insist on, is the link between teaching and, and writing or research. And I think it's a very important one. Sometimes you hear from academic colleagues that, you know, there's teaching and, oh, gosh, it's such a bore and it takes time away from research. And I just don't buy that. My best ideas have come to me when I've taught and... I've had to explain in the most direct, sensible, clear way to students 
what are some of the fundamentals we're dealing with here? And I've understood my discipline better when I've done that. And uh, so, uh, and you know, when you do that also, you, you kind of, when you're preparing slides or a lecture, you suddenly realize that there are enormous gaps in knowledge. You think that there are all kinds of handy dandy books and articles that will answer a certain question. And then you realize there aren't. And that indicates that there's a gap and an opportunity to write something. So I think that that's very important. But equally, research is very important to teaching, which is to say the best moment in teaching is when you can bring to bear an area that you're mining in your research um, into the classroom. It just, you know, there's a then a kind of authenticity to what you say and do and a richness to it. Students can feel that you have chewed on this and have really made sense of it. And I think they can feel the, the kind of passion and excitement you bring then. Yeah, that's, that's fascinating. It's something I can relate to in the sense that, you know, I felt that I began to understand writing better when I actually started teaching it and not so much before that. And equally, when I taught podcasting as someone who actually does a podcast, it just came that much more naturally and it also fed back. So it wasn't just that my doing of podcasting helped my teaching of it, but while teaching it, I began to think more at a meta level, for example, about the nature of interviewing and, you know, the different kinds of approaches you can take to conversations and all of that, which I think also helped my craft as a practitioner. Now, here's a question. When you write a book and not just this book, but when you write any other book in a field where a lot of growth in terms of knowledge is sort of incremental uh, you know gradually the layers come over years and decades and so on and so forth it strikes me that there might be therefore uh, two competing pressures that you might face and one pressure would be that I have to say something new that I have to in some way add to this body of knowledge which could be dangerous because it could lead to someone trying too hard for example or there could be a pressure which would probably you know maybe come from a publisher who might you know want to pitch a book for the masses or whatever and there the pressure might be that come up with something definitive like if you're writing a book on India versus China be definitive about the why be definitive about the what will happen going ahead which of course you can't because it's incredibly messy and muddy and you know every good scholar will have that humility to accept that especially in a field like this that there is so much that may never be known how do you deal Deal with these sort of competing pressures? Is this stuff that you've thought about? Have you ever, as a young academic, perhaps erred on one side or the other? I suppose I have. I mean, I uh, increasingly have become kind of, um, what's the word? I mean, slightly slightly more modest is, is the word that springs to mind right at the moment, and or moderate. In a way, a different way of saying it is, I've, I've stopped taking myself so seriously. And what that means in the writing is that I'm committed to trying to present stuff clearly, uh, use the word kindly about the book, uh, lucidity. And I think that's an important thing to do now more and more. And uh, take the example of this book. I think those two pressures are exactly right, which is that on the one hand, as academics, we're always taught, you know, uh, value add, look for something quite original that you're, you're trying to say and communicate. Otherwise, don't bother. I mean, you're just adding to the noise in the system and overloading it. On the other hand, you know, uh, I think the publishers set me a time limit, uh, which meant that I couldn't do, you know, a very original research. I couldn't delve into some archival material that was that nobody else had touched or brought to light. I didn't have the time to come up with uh, a grand theoretical proposition or a set of concepts that are used to interrogate relatively uh, familiar materials and give us a different perspective on it. So I didn't have that leeway either. And so it seemed to me that, you know, I ought to kind of make a virtue out of all of these uh, different constraints or, or opportunities and settle for the kind of book in a way that Juggernaut were urging on me, which is in three months, can I pull together quite a lot of stuff that's already out there that's quite well known and put it into some sort of a framework, nothing too revolutionary, nothing too rigorous and stringent uh, intellectually, such that I would have to get into very convoluted arguments about theories and concepts and to show that, you know, here was a brilliant new incision into the problem and a way of thinking about not just India-China relations, but perhaps all these kinds of enduring rivalries. So, it seemed to me that we I needed to strike a balance somewhere in between. 
And I think if the book has success, then it it may have uh, struck that balance. I pulled together relatively respectable, well-known materials already out there and pulled it into a simple framework, uh, nothing too too sophisticated. And that made it uh, fairly quick and easy to write. Uh, I think it makes it, and it may solve your problem of someday remembering something about this book. The four Ps may, may stay in your brain for a while. And I think, you know, that might allow me to clothe the material in a way that was easy on the eye of, of the beholder. I mean, I could dress in a very jazzy way when I go out, and but if you dress simply, perhaps the image of uh, you walking around will endure. So I think I tried to use the four Ps idea to make it simpler for, uh, for a reader and uh, yet provide some kind of a, a scaffolding with which, with which to arrange the empirical materials. Yeah, yeah, and and uh, you've absolutely succeeded in that, in my view. But we'll talk about that as we go along. Let's let's go back to your personal history, which is also very fascinating because you are the son of a diplomat. Uh, you know, your father was a very famous uh, diplomat, Girija Shankar Bajpai, who you well, know. That's my grandfather. A, that's... that's your grandfather. Sorry, that's what I meant. Yeah, yeah. and uh, a famous photograph of him with uh, Nehru as well at a 1948 conference and so on. And you travel the world, like in your book, you've written about how you know when uh, the China War happened uh, in '62, you were in London and it was cold and you were freezing. And that strikes me as, uh, you know, uh, traveling around the world and all of that as a very consequential childhood to have because it means you are different from all the other kids your age at that point. And one can speculate about why that may, may be the case. Maybe you are less ossified in your ways of thinking about your people and other people and so on. Maybe there's a natural sense of curiosity that can evolve from there and uh, so on and so forth. So, you know, looking back, what was your childhood like? And is there something to the sense that you you feel that it shaped you differently from what it would have, say, had you just grown up in Delhi, for example? Yeah, so I'm a diplomat's kid, a uh, foreign service brat. And I think uh, those kids all over the world, from whichever foreign service they're in, they do tend to be more ecumenical, uh, perhaps more liberal is the world, a word, or cosmopolitan. I think through their schooling, as they move around with their parents, inevitably they're forced to look through other worldviews. You go to school, you encounter foreigners, you in part take on their worldviews inevitably and see the world through their eyes as well. Uh, Curiously, of course, the other side of it is that as a diplomat's kid, you're also immersed in your nationalism, your country perspective around the dinner table with your parents, your siblings, uh, the other kids in the embassy, the other members of the embassy. Uh, there's a, a very Indian kind of you know national environment as well. And there's that lens simultaneously. So I think the thing with diplomats' kids are is that from almost the day of mother's milk, they're always bifocal, always looking through things through that national lens, which they're immersed in, and their heart beats to it, but they're also constantly encountering other views, how others see us, how others see our country, how others see other countries, uh, third countries, and of course, their own country. And you as a diplomat son have a, a certain perspective on the host country, and then you get a picture of the host country refracted through the lens of uh, the citizens of that country that you encounter. Uh, I think diplomats' kids are are like that, and they have to be open to that. I mean, they have to fit in in both environments and make sense of both environments constantly. So they're constantly testing reality against both these lenses. And I mean, I think it's a good thing. Uh, I mean, I don't mean to say that those who haven't had that opportunity don't have their own kind of strength. uh, perhaps are more unifocal and know what they know and are not easily deflected and have great certainty about things that they do and think. And uh, we need people like that in the world as well. But we also need people who want to roll things around their tongue, who want to be more playful, who want to exper- be experimental intellectually. I mean, I don't mean to say that I'm the most creative human being in the world by any means because of this upbringing. I wouldn't say that's uh, true, and there are other forces that operate on on that issue. But I think I'm, my reflexive 
uh, starting point, as it were, is that I don't like to go with the herd, with any herd. And I'm always, my antenna always go up when people are too insistent on a singular point of view. And I think that, you know, that was a bit of a struggle for me in my childhood. The first 11 years or so, my parents were outside India. Uh, they continued to be, but they did feel when I was 11 years old that I had to come back to India and be in an Indian environment, partly because um, they felt that I was losing a, a touch with Indian reality. Um, and also because uh, they were moving around constantly and the schools were, you know, an unsettling experience if you keep moving schools every three or four years. And so I went back to boarding school in Delhi and then Dehradun. And I think it was a fabulous thing that my parents did. And so I had an upbringing uh, as a diplomats kid where I, I sort of was raised to be uncomfortable with herd mentalities, with givens, with an orthodoxy. And I think that's remained with me. When I started out in more public life as an academic on television in the 80s and 90s, when I was pretty active in Delhi, you know, I, I exited into a period when I was very certain about stuff and I argued very stringently about things like uh, India's nuclear weapons options and so on. I think actually after that period, an intermittent phase of being so singular, I've come back to now rolling things around my tongue, I think a bit more. And... Uh, that's recovering that sort of diploma, early, early uh, immersion in this bifocal world that I grew up in. Uh, so just, just sort of thinking aloud, I mean, this brings me to another sort of question that often strikes me. Like when I look at young people growing up today, so many of them choose to do all their thinking and their talking and their posturing and whatever it is in public, which strikes me as something dangerous because, you know, if everything that I thought or wrote in my teens or 20s was, uh, you know, on Twitter and people took screenshots and all of that, one, of course, it would not be fair because young people need that kind of space to grow up and change their mind and roll things on their tongue as uh, you put it so well. But uh, the other thing that it can do is that it can ossify you into positions. Like when you're 17 or 18, you might go online, you might might find a tribe and you might join that tribe and you're part of an echo chamber and then you raise your status within that echo chamber with harsher and harsher pronouncements and you know by signaling virtue more vociferously than the next guy and so on and so forth and because you take those stances you start believing them they become much harder uh, than they would otherwise have been and to me that strikes me as a danger and a shame that like once you write something down definitively once you identify yourself with a certain way of thinking, then you change. You change to the extent that you're more likely to hold on to that. And so do you think that that's a danger in these modern times where a position once taken actually ends up shaping who you are? Like in your case, you said, uh, you know, you had more certainty about certain positions in the 80s or whatever when you would be on television as a talking head. But those clips don't exist on YouTube, right? People are not going to put screenshots of your old article saying, hey, you said this in 1983. So uh, you have any uh, thoughts on the changing times and how they can change a person? person's uh, development of self even because you're just so much more out there. Yeah, isn't it an irony that um, this technology that came along of the social media and, and all of that and the uh, unending, uh, limitless kind of memory now with cloud and so on that's there. I suppose the promise was that this would lead to kind of enormous uh, liberalization of thought that people would be able to express themselves who otherwise would not be able to because they couldn't write a column for a newspaper. They wouldn't be asked on television as a talking head. But now they can, I mean, because there's so many platforms where they can be heard. And so I guess, I mean, I, I, I uh, went along with that thought that there's something greatly liberalizing that would happen as a result of this. Uh, although I wasn't much until very recently on social media platforms or, or any of those uh, uh, kinds of instruments. But it's turned out that, as you say, I mean, uh, they've become kind of silos, uh, echo chambers. Uh, they become uh, platforms for insulting people. And, and when you insult someone, I mean, there are a couple of reactions. One is they could exit the system, uh, though that seems to be quite hard to do. You just uh, re uh, become aloof and, and exit. Uh, the other is that, you know, you fight back and you fight back to you dig in your, uh, to your point of view even more stringently and become more stubborn and lose your plasticity and openness to 
to disconfirming co- uh, facts or to alternative perspectives. And the third, of course, is that, you know, you, you do sort of on the platforms themselves, you know, uh, show that you can change your mind and and uh, ch- uh, change over time uh, uh, more or less. And I think that it seems to me that all three are quite difficult, but I would like to think that I, I would try and do the third, which is uh, try to signal that if you do make a point uh, about my work or or something I've just said, which holds promise of, of even a critique of me, that I'm open to it. And, you know, I went on Twitter uh, when this book was uh, coming on online because uh, Juggernaut said, come on, Kanti, you've got to just get out there and uh, move with the times. And of course, it's good for the book and uh, your ideas. And I've already had people challenge me, sometimes dismissively, sometimes slightly insultingly, sometimes uh, generously, but but with disagreement. And I think one has to deal with that. And I I, I, I hope it hasn't been huge, but I, I've tried to deal with it by sort of saying, yeah, uh, you may have something there. The book was the first um, cut at this problem. It's not the last uh, cut on the problem. It's not the definitive word. And by the way, what is a definitive word in you know, in such a complicated world. But if it's provoking and fostering a conversation, as long as we keep it more or less uh, polite, let's let's proceed. So I think, you know, to my mind, we're stuck with these platforms. I mean, whether we like it or not, I don't think we're going to resile and move away from them very much. And there's something emancipatory and, and celebratory about them. And I think we have to work our way through to a place where some of the really dark tonalities will uh, reduce. And people will learn that, you know, insulting, terribly stubborn kinds of uh, sticking to your points of view, uh, being dismissive about others really just doesn't work. And I I still have that positive progressive view that dialogue in itself, they'll be learning from it. And I think, you know, I'm just getting a sense in the last few months that I've been on Twitter that something like that is already perhaps beginning to happen. And the last point I would make is that, you know, I mean... Nobody can be consistent over their entire lifetime, and it would be idiotic to to be so. I think uh, that was addressed to Gandhi on his, you know, his change of view of violence and war and his participation. You know, back in the day, he he had uh, come out in favor of recruiting troops for the British cause in the early part of the 20th century. He had tried to recruit people for the Boer War. He had, uh, you know, participated as an ambulance uh, a uh, person in in um, the First World War, I think, uh, or the the Boer War. So s- people said to him, "Well, I mean, this uh, back then you did that, and now you're preaching nonviolent. You're not consistent." And you know, he said, "Yeah, I mean, uh, I'm not consistent. Uh, times change. I change. Uh, why do you expect me to be consistent?" And I think uh, Keynes said it more. Was it Keynes who said something like? You know? gains. If, if the facts change, I change my mind. So what do you do? Yeah, well done. I mean, you said it much. Uh, yeah, that's exactly. And I usually tr- push that out there as well. So uh, I think that's a useful thing to say. Yeah, no, I, th- I think you've kind of largely had a sort of a lucky experience on Twitter because a lot of your interactions would kind of be self-selected, like people who are A, already interested in your work and therefore a certain kind of person and B, when you follow a lot of scholars you admire, they follow you back, you're kind of curating your feed. I think one of the essential ways of tackling Twitter is curate your feed very carefully and you can get enormous insight and have great conversations that way. But by and large, uh, the other thing that I've noticed about Twitter, which is interesting, is that, you know, we tend to think that the whole space is incredibly toxic. Now, the truth is that there are these vocal minorities who are incredibly toxic because they are caught in these echo chambers and always posturing and so on. But there's a vast silent majority, which is not like that at all, which is something that I realize through my podcast and through the courses that I've done where, you know, I popularize them through Twitter, people sign on, you you realize what those people are like. And then you look on Twitter where everyone is shouting. And I'm kind of baffled by just the fundamental rudeness that uh, Twitter brings to the discourse, like the act of quote tweeting, for example, where you quote tweet someone and you mock them. And that's so incredibly rude because, you know, if you and I were talking at a party and I said something that you disagreed with, you would not immediately turn to our neighbor and point at me and say, look, this guy is a fool. This guy is a moron. He's saying this. That's just so so incredibly rude. It's so bizarre, you know, that we have to not take anything in good faith at all. But this is a digression. Why should we talk about these times where we still have uh, the past to talk about? So tell me a little bit more about your childhood. Did you like to read? You studied at Dune School also for a while. 
what was that like? Because on the one hand, you pointed out that your parents wanted you to be back home because they felt that you were being away from the realities of India, as it were. Now, when I look back on my also privileged uh, childhood as a son of a civil servant, uh, although I didn't live all over the world in India itself, but nevertheless, massively privileged childhood and going to good schools and so on. And as I grew into adulthood, I realized what a blinkered view of the world I had been given just by, you know, the occasion of my privilege that, okay, I am the child of these people uh, you know I'm using my dad's car to go here or to go there this is the kind of school I am everyone else is also an incredibly pampered kid and this is like one view of India from one particular vantage point and you kind of grow older reach adulthood and uh, and you realize that there's so much more to this and so one what was doing school like and two I presume that everyone you studied with at the time would be present day elites like uh, i did an episode with ramchandra guha where he told me about his time in college in delhi where his classmates uh, his list of classmates is like a who's who of uh, uh, you know uh, india today a small group of people so tell me a bit about that experience and how your thinking kind of evolves through that and then we'll move on to your personal journey and uh, you know what you studied and all of that well, first of all, Ram Guha was uh, with me at school, at Doon School. Oh, he was, okay. he was wow. one year uh, uh, behind me. And, See, there uh, you go. <laughs> uh, there you are. So, um, but I, I think that, you know, first of all, when I came back to India, I went to St. Xavier's School in Delhi, in Civil Lines in Delhi. It, it had a boarding section in those days. And uh, quite a number of diplomats kids, uh, Indian Foreign Service kids were there. And that's where I started out. Although my father uh, was a Doon School boy. In fact, he was the first school captain of the school. So, you know, I had a link to the school. My brother had been there. My uncles had been there. But my father didn't actually send me there. Uh, he was posted to Pakistan at that time in the uh, deputy high commissionership of uh, in Karachi. And he would come to Delhi periodically. And he thought that my transition back to India, along with my two elder brothers and my younger sister, that he would see us occasionally and that would help us transition back to Indian life. So I was in St. Xavier's for three and a half years. And when they decided to close the boarding, he then uh, petitioned Doon School to, to take me because I joined the school quite late in comparison to other boys. So I think the experience of the two schools were very different. I mean, St. Xavier's was basically a huge day school with this little boarding element. And uh, it, it, as you know, it's a Jesuit school. So uh, there was a very, very uh, different kind of atmosphere. I wouldn't say it was a religious atmosphere in the sense of, you know, we all had to uh, keep to sort of a Catholic orthodoxies or anything like that. It wasn't shoved down our throat. Although there was an evening prayer and you could say it or you could just hold your hands and say your own prayer quietly uh, and so on. So, uh, but uh, I think, you know, there was studying and there was a bit of uh, stuff on the sports field and that was pretty much your life. Um, and it was um, uh, very disciplined in the sense that uh, every moment of your day was metered and clearly your studies were the primary thing. And, and, and the students there, they were all mostly kids from Delhi who for one reason or another, you know, uh, couldn't be day students. Maybe they lived too far away in Delhi. There were people from outside Delhi, but from in and around Delhi, not very far away. Some diplomats kids as well. But Doon School was very different. And, you know, I think we think that, and there's a view, popular view, that Doon School, Mayor College of Mayor, Sindhya School in Gwalior, these so-called uh, public schools, they're the Baba Log School. But actually, the picture is rather different. It's the big day schools that are the Baba Log schools. Because the big business guys, the, the very senior civil servants, the politicians' kids, they tend to go to the big day schools, modern school in Delhi, St. Columba, St. Xavier's in Bombay, Campion, and um, uh, schools like that. Whereas the kids who go to Doon School or Mayo College, uh, these are people who are from the second and third tier towns mostly of India. And in Doon School, they are mostly from the second and third tier towns of UP, now Uttarakhand as well, Haryana, Punjab, uh, sometimes from Bihar, UP, Madhya Pradesh, some kids from Southern India, and later some uh, students from Northeast India. Uh, but Delhi party, so-called, uh, or Bombay party, or Calcutta party, these were uh, really a distinct minority of, of the school. And the reason for that is that, you know, it was the students 
from uh, these small towns, Saharanpur, places like that, Batinda, et cetera, et cetera, who didn't have a lot of facilities, whose uh, local schools weren't necessarily all that great. And these second, third tier elites who wanted to give their kids, you know, an imprimatur, a better school experience as well, then look to boarding schools like Dune School. And so actually, most of the students, even in my time, I wouldn't say they were the, 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 the greatest elite types. There were some Maharaja's kids. There were some big business kids. There were some, you know, senior civil servant kids. But there were a lot of kids from small businesses or farmers' children. I mean, I don't mean small farmers, but, you know, medium-sized farmer families and so on and so forth. People who are in uh, second and third tier towns from uh, services backgrounds. That is to say, they provided some service locally. The tea estates in, in Assam and so on. And actually, that's grown. When I was headmaster of the school, we did a, a survey of the kinds of students. And I can tell you that, you know, most of the children overwhelmingly were from these second and thir- third tier towns. And contrary to the view, I would say a very large proportion, more so than when I was at the school as a boy, uh, were comfortable in Hindi primarily. And certainly their parents were more comfortable in Hindi. I would say more than 50% of the kids at Dune School, their parents would be more comfortable in uh, expressing themselves in Hindi. And so that was one part of the school that it actually wasn't that uh, uh, Babalu elite at, at, uh, mostly. And I think the other thing was about Dune School was that it forced you out of, I mean, of course, the school is a gated community, but you have to get out and live your life also in Dehradun on outings, for instance. And it's not Delhi. Uh, uh, The school has no amenities of the kind that you have in the big cities. I mean, in those days in Dehradun and even until recently, there were no malls. There were no multiplexes. There were certainly no discos and all of that. And the other experience was that, particularly to Dune School, was that from the beginning, thanks to the first two headmasters we had and the Indian teachers of the time, They insisted on two things that forced you out into the community. One was from the beginning, what later got to be called in India, SUPW, socially useful productive work. And I think it was probably pretty much started at Dune School and a few other schools like that, which is there was an insistence that the students had to go out and do community work in villages in particular. And that was a requirement of the school. You had a little logbook and you had to write down how much of that you did, you could do some of that within the school as well. But quite a lot of it was going out into the community. The second was that every term for five days, you had to go trekking in the hills. And you went to very remote places and locales from Dehradun uh, northwards. And I mean, I don't want to oversell it as, as a kind of foray into ordinary India, but but it was at one level. I mean, you came up against just, you know, nature, the mountains, the hills, ordinary people in villages who often helped you as you were, uh, you know, dealing with the terrain and geography and so on out there. So I think that in some ways it was more of an experience of getting out of metropolitan life that I had grown up in because I grew up in Paris and London uh, before I came home to Delhi. And then if I got out of St. Xavier's school, it was Delhi of the 1960s. But Dehradun of the 1960s was something very different. And the mountains and hills and surrounding villages, I mean, it was, it was not a metropolitan life uh, in that sense at all. And I think the school still uh, gives people a bit of a connect to an India that's outside metropolitan life. And one reason I took the headmastership, and I'll just end uh, this segment with that thought perhaps, is that uh, I wanted my children who were growing up kind of the Baba Log life in uh, JNU, where I was a warden of a hostel and where they were going to, you know, kind of Baba Log schools, uh, the new schools, the Vasant Valleys or the Sri Ram schools, where all the kids were businessmen's kids or very senior civil servants kids who were all very metropolitan and cosmopolitan. Whereas when they got to Dune School and Wellam Girls, my daughter went to Wellam Girls later, my son went to Dune School. I mean, it was a very different set of parents and boys. And uh, I thought uh, my kids needed that. They needed to get out of uh, Delhi. Yeah, that's, that's fascinating. A lot to think about. You know, I, I, I must confess here that I had that impression of Dune being a Babalo kind of school as well. You hear about, you know, uh, the Gandhis going there and so on and so forth. And that's what you imagine. So this is, um, 
quite fascinating. So, you know, we'll take another digression before we get back to our narrative of personal biography. And uh, this, you know, I'm struck by the phrase, it was not like the Delhi of the 1960s. And obviously, I understand the contrast which you're talking about between 1960s Delhi and 1960s Dehradun. But, uh, you know, for someone who lives in Delhi today, for a young person today, how would you describe 1960s Delhi? Like, how has it changed? What was it like back then? Because I would find it impossible, for example, very hard, not impossible to describe 1980s Delhi, which I know a little bit better. But what was 1960s really like? I'm also curious. It was a very quiet town. Uh, and I literally mean that. I don't mean uh, it metaphorically. It was quiet. Uh, you could go out into, you know, central Delhi, uh, Lutchins' Delhi, and walk around there. with. There was no hubbub. They weren't, you know, pile driving cars and trucks and buses and honking and all of that. It was a quiet city. It was gracious in the sense that there wasn't this kinds of very aggressive sort of scenes and moments that uh, you felt, you feel now, or even in 1980s Delhi. And I think it was a Delhi, uh, I think, to be fair, it was a Lutyens' Delhi in the sense of an elite uh, that was more anglicized, um, more westernized, living in bungalow life and in a, the few select colonies. It was a much cleaner Delhi. Uh, it was a very livable city at that level. There weren't any fancy malls, obviously, or fancy cineplexes. There were very few foreign goods. There was none of that. If you went to Khan Market, for, there were no shop hoardings visible, pretty much. There were a few cars and, and, and motorbikes. And uh, you went into shops where everything was available in cupboards, in behind glass cupboards. And, and it was very unglamorous, all Indian goods, basically. So it was a very different kind of Delhi. I think it was comfortable at that level. Um, and it was a pretty westernized elitist Delhi. And for diplomats' kids, and, and you know, my, my father's family had been in Delhi since New Delhi was built in the 1920s. My grandfather had come from UP at that time. And so, I mean, personally, of course, when I did get out of St. Xavier's school, I came back from Dune School briefly on my way to see my parents wherever they were abroad. It was a Delhi where uh, I knew a lot of people through family connections and so on. Uh, so it was, a, it was a different experience, I think. And there's a sort of a sense of nostalgia about it. It was a very tractable Delhi. It wasn't very big, I think. I mean, when I went from St. Xavier's School to visit my grandmother in South Delhi, you know, she, she had a plot of land in Friends Colony. My friends who used to laugh at me and say, oh, you're going off to Faridabad, you know. Uh, so it was the edge of town. And uh, a really big adventurous outing was to go to South Extension. Uh, when my parents would come from Pakistan to visit for a time, they would take me to South Extension and my friends would be uh, very excited about, you know, you're going to the edge of the town. And Vasant Vihar, I mean, if you looked out from Modern Bazaar, the, the shop there, there was nothing but farmland there. So, you know, the landscape was very, very, very different in Delhi. Delhi was civil lines in North Delhi and all of that. And then, you know, Rajpath and Lachins' Delhi and Defence Colony, Friends Colony were the outer limits. Um, and so I think it was very tractable. I would walk sometimes. I could walk from my uncle's house at Wellesley Road from the uh, Armed Forces officers mess there to Connaught Place. Connaught Place was a centre for, you know, things happening, discotheques and shops and, and, and fast food, uh, such as it was. And... You know, I would think nothing of uh, walking there as a 14-year-old or a 15-year-old, uh, getting into a scooter. And, you know, you would be on a street uh, waiting for a scooter and it would be pin drop silence. And then you would hear a car come, if I could very badly mimic the sense of it, of a kind of and a car would go and then there would be silence again. That's unimaginable, I think, almost anywhere in Delhi today. So... Uh, yeah, that was a Delhi and I, I miss it. But, you know, Delhi today has its own excitement and vibrancy, I think. So uh, you can't live in the past. Yeah, yeah, you can't live in the past. You also mentioned that you went to Dehradun because, I mean, one reason was that you wanted your kids to have a life outside the Babalog life and all that. Babalog, by the way, would be such a lovely name for a novel because you can read it both ways, right? Babalog and Babalog. And, and that's one reason why you went there. But I guess another reason for why a place like that would be extremely attractive is, like you said, the quietness of it, the pace of life being so slow, the hills around and so on. And, you know, at an abstract level, many of us 
aspire to that we say ki nahi yaar paharon mein ja ke rahenge and we'll you know live a quiet life like that but at the same time the kind of life you might want to live in the abstract collides with the kind of things you want to do in the concrete which often require being in a big city which are often not just work but often just other things meeting friends regularly and so on and so forth is that something you've thought about because when i was just reading the bare facts of your uh, sort of biography it's it struck me that you bounced around a lot that you know you've traveled with your diplomat father you've been in uh, doon school and all of that you've done the schooling here your uh, sort of ba and ma at british columbia then your phd at uh, illinois then you come back to doon school and in between you've taught at doon school you come back there as a headmaster then you come back to delhi you're at jnu and uh, now you're in singapore so how how does one think of that like does one think of how one wants to live one's life purely uh, in terms of career goals that these are the things i want to study or explore or this would be an interesting institution to be part of or uh, have you also had other considerations while kind of uh, planning your life out that this is also where i want to be this kind of life suits me i think i mean uh, i'd love to say that you know i uh, was a person who thought that bouncing around and moving jobs and so on uh was i mean i that i kind of was ahead of the curve i mean who stays in a job for very long now uh, it seems to be the norm that you move around and you're hyper mobile between jobs between locales but i don't think i was that clever or imaginative or adventurous i just went where the jobs were i mean my father was a civil servant he had a plot of land that he inherited but he had no money to give me he was not really willing to exert himself to get me a job of any kind and uh, the one time he tried i mean it was a uh, farcical and it didn't suit me anyway so i had to make my way in the world and i just went where i thought uh, somebody would actually want me and my first foray to doon school in 1979 80 was i mean basically i mean my dad made it fairly clear that uh, i couldn't be on the payroll for very long and i had to get off and uh start uh, arranging my life and uh, my finances and when i said no i'm not interested in sitting for the civil service or going into business then uh he was like okay beta then uh, better make some plans uh, of moving on you can't live with me forever and um not being adventurous uh i just looked for who would want me i hoped that someone in journalism might want me but there weren't many places in those days so i wrote off to my old school and uh so i went to doon school to teach for a year but what i realized was that i'm not really a schoolmaster per se and this so after a year i went on to do the phd in america but uh when i was finishing at illinois uh finishing the phd uh what i did know was that i didn't want to live in america i thoroughly enjoyed my time in in the us and earlier in canada but it just didn't seem to me that america was really deep in my heart that way and american lifestyles suited me even though you know up to that point most of my life had been in the west but i just thought that there was something in terms of lifestyles and the future that uh didn't work for me and my wife was canadian white canadian and uh, i think she sort of had a little bit of a sense that she would like to be back in north america for the longer time but um she was very very uh, kind to me and i think indulged me a lot and and we uh, she agreed that uh, you know uh, we would move back to india and um i was um, encouraged by my supervisor steve cohen who wanted to train indian and other south asian students to go back so that they could uh, hopefully uh, make a contribution to the intellectual life of their own country particularly academic life and so with his encouragement also i I uh, uh thought about coming back to India as soon as I finished and my first job actually you, you missed it but I don't blame you but it was in Baroda uh at MS University in Baroda and that was partly because although JNU was a natural habitat for me uh it has such a massive school of international studies one of the biggest in the world at 85 faculty members you know at the time that I finally uh, went there but I still had an instinct that I wanted to start out decentered from the center i wanted to be away from delhi and i had had my first uh, child she was very young my daughter gayatri and i think my wife bobby was a bit dubious living in a small town in india she knew delhi she lived in dehradun with me for a while but but i thought that it would be a bit of an adventure and it would be nice to see another part of india and i had a cousin there who taught in the history department and she told me about the job op- opening and there weren't too many other jobs in international relations i applied for it I got it and I 
I remember I finished defending my PhD thesis on a on a Saturday morning or some such. And I was back in India on the Wednesday. And I think I joined MS University on a Friday. I mean, I may have got the days of the week and all that mixed up, but it was within four or five days of finishing the PhD. I was back in India and, and uh, in harness, as it were. And, you know, from there, I moved back to the States for a while. I thought the university, which had been glorious for two or three years, was going in a direction that I wasn't enjoying uh, ultimately. And uh, that's a slightly different story. It was getting a bit too nativist for me, but uh, they were good years. I had a second child and I went back uh, essentially to Illinois for about a year. But again, with no thought of really staying there, although, again, I think my wife would have quite liked to be back with in North America with her family. But again, I mean, one day I got a phone call sitting in Illinois in my office and it was Abid Hussain, the famous Indian civil servant and uh, ex-ambassador to the U.S. And he'd been, I think, deputy chairman of the planning commission or some such. And I had never met him. And he just said, uh, Babu? And I said, I'm sorry, who is this? He said, Are main Abid bol raho, Abid Hussain. And of course, I'd heard of him, but the, he spoke to me in such a familiar way that I was kind of drawn to him and into his world almost immediately. And he was vice chairman of the Rajiv Gandhi Foundation and the Rajiv Gandhi Institute of Contemporary Studies, which was the think tank wing of the RGF. And he said, Tumhare bari mein suna hai. I've heard about you uh, from Steve Cohen, who's here at the Ford Foundation in Delhi. And he said, you're very keen to come back to India. And Tumaja, come for a couple of years and help me uh, with this think tank. And uh, then you can do what you like. And I mean, a few, I finished the semester. A few weeks later, I packed my bags and uh, uh, Bobby and I and the babies uh, headed home. So I think, you know, I mean, I, I, I won't tell you every step of the way of what happened since then, but I think I went where serendipitously jobs opened up. I think there was a broad trajectory, which was that I always wanted to be home in India, uh, doing something in India. I was comfortable. So it was a personal kind of comfort issue. I did have a bit of a sense of, can I do something for my country? But I mean, I'm not trying to dress myself up as being somebody overly noble and, and, and all of that. But I just sort of felt comfortable and good and it seemed to work for me. And uh, I would say it sort of paid off, you know, my whole professional life developed and flowered really in, in, in India. And I'm tremendously grateful to the institutions that took a chance on me, my students that helped make me what I am, the media in the 1980s that uh, gave me an opportunity to make a bit, bit of a name for myself and all the rest of it. I mean, my colleagues. And that's how all, uh, again, why did I go to Dune School? I got a, a call one day as I was rushing off to do my early morning lectures, which I'm never good at in early in the morning, and uh, somebody just said, uh, Dr. Bajpai. And I said, uh, yeah. I said, uh, I'm so-and-so from a search company. And somebody mentioned that you might be a candidate for the headmastership of the school. It's your old school. And I said, oh, my gosh. Uh, well, I'm running off to class. But I mean, I can't discuss it. But no, I never thought about it. And I said, well, are you kind of open to it? And I said, well, which old boy wouldn't be? But not really. No, at, at this point. And he said, but would you like to have a chat later about it? And I said, well, of course, I can't say no to that. And so, you know, another serendipitous thing happened. And that took me off to there. That's fascinating. And what's also fascinating is when you talk about these two phone calls. And I, you know, I must remind our listeners that today when we say I received a phone call, it means, you know, you've got your mobile phone and mine is always on silent. So if I get a phone call, it's because I'm looking at my phone already, maybe going through Twitter like a junkie and, you know, the phone flashes and I pick it up, but otherwise I'm not going to pick it up. And in, in uh, at the time you would have got the phone call, it would have been a physical instrument. It would have rung two or three times. You move towards it. You wonder who's calling. There's no caller ID you pick it up and then the person says what they say and that's also such a charming recounting Mr. Hussain saying Babu <laughs> it's like it's, it's it's so cinematic almost the scene that you kind of describe so maybe uh, after the biography if a movie is made on your life that could be uh, a pivotal scene maybe add some dramatic elements to it look outside after the phone call and your car blows up something like that anyway so <laughs> let's sort of go back to the final strand of your personal journey that I'm curious about which is that how did you get into the specific areas that 
you got into like when people are kids you know they'll dream of being a pilot or an ice cream seller or a movie star they won't dream of being like a foreign policy scholar or a noted academic and so on so how did this kind of happen was it again serendipitous that you do one thing at a time and it takes you to that final destination or did you have a sense at some point that no these are the things that i find fascinating that i want to go deeper into that i want to wake up in the morning and look forward to the day and reading these kind of books studying this kind of subject will give me that happiness how how was that for you i think there was no straight line for me as there probably isn't for most people you know and as i said i was not a a person who knew so definitively everything that i thought and wanted to do and 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 how i looked at the world but i think quite early i had a sense that something to do with the written word always was very important for me my eldest brother sham was uh, we would say a bookworm he i think he introduced me to the world of books uh, a lot and things like chess and 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 intellectual matters a lot and uh, my other brother ishwari who went on to be a journalist and he introduced me to sports and competition and being in the world you know being outside of myself and i mean i'm i, I play a lot of sports or i did but i'm not a sportsman per se it wasn't that influence that ishwari had on me it was that being in the world being uh, active in the world and he's a, a person of strong views and uh, ideas and he can be much more argumentative in a good way and i think i got that from him uh, from my brother and i think uh, from my younger sister i got a sense of a certain kind of uh, loyalty or commitment to a sort of family and and all of that and uh, the metaphor for me there is i think you know not being very public or demonstrative but doing something quietly towards the well-being of others i think my sister is a very outward person giving to family and all of that and what that means i think for me in my arena was i mean trying to give something back to the public wheel i mean i don't want to state it too grandly but i think my siblings had quite a an impact on me but why this area then i mean i think it developed gradually my father forced me to do economics because my brothers especially my eldest brother said oh no the world the way the world is going you know they were all history students my dad had done history at st stephens both my brothers did history at st stephens and they got together when i was finishing at dune school and said dad uh, you know kanti cannot do history and better for him not to go to st stephens too many bajpais went there and kind of wasted their time <laughs> so get out of it and he, uh, my dad was an ambassador high commission in canada and i went off to do an economics degree but my heart was not in economics really although i kept and i i i thank economics for you know instilling me the idea of thinking about things a bit systematically trying to have a bit of a framework i uh, introduced me to issues like the philosophy of science and things like that that i think held me in good stead and i loved mathematics so uh, the only attraction i had in uh, economics was math uh, to be honest but what developed in me through uh, my undergrad days in economics was that i started to do some political science courses and something along the way in in my school life uh, i began to develop this feeling that indian democracy i mean that it, it seemed very firm this is i mean i went to canada in 1973 i began my economics degree in 1973 and of course it was kind of a high tide still of democracy it was before the emergency we were still in a kind of post neruvian glow a neruvian glow but i i think i had a little bit of a sense that indian democracy was still quite tenuous and in one of my courses in my second or third year under a professor called john wood who was an indianist i read a lot of stuff about civil military relations and what came out of that was how many countries in the third world had had military coups including our, uh, pakistan our neighbor here was a military that was born of the same original military the same genus the indian army but it had intervened in politics in 1958 and by the way i lived in pakistan uh, you know in the 60s because my dad was the deputy high commissioner there and so i had a sense that you know it may be that Indian democracy was perhaps more tenuous and i thought initially that india also might succumb to in a moment of crisis or instability to a, a kind of right wing military coup at some point and 
later, I began to worry about the left wing. I thought, you know, with, uh, I don't know at what point, but gradually, perhaps it was the Naxalites of the 19, late 1960s. My brother, Sham, had been at St. Stephen's College and some of his friends had become Naxalites and so on. And so maybe I knew a little bit about that. And I was studying political philosophy and uh, it, it, alongside economics. And I had a sense that there could be a moment when the right wing and the left wing in India would be thrown into this kind of antagonistic dialectic and the liberal space in India would collapse. And my interest in social science became more political science than economics. And even in economics, I did uh, my the course I loved the most was economic development theory. And quite a lot of my interest there was what are the political underpinnings of economic growth and development? And I thought, uh, perhaps naively, that democracy and liberalism made for, you know, for long term economic growth. And I was a bit worried that India, I was puzzled why India is a relatively liberal democratic country was still at, you know, in those days, the so-called Hindu rate of growth. We weren't growing very fast. So I think that led me to grad school in America where I wanted to do civil military relations. That's why I ended up with Steve Cohen at the University of Illinois, because he was the expert on the Indian Army, uh, on civil military relations in India. And I didn't know it at the time, but he was already more or less finishing a book on the Pakistani military and I hoped to write a book on comparative civil military relations in South Asia. I thought India, Pakistan, and Bangladesh. When I arrived there, he'd already written the book on Pakistan. But what stayed with me there was that, I mean, I was introduced to international relations there. I had come thinking doing comparative politics, civil military relations, doing political theory because I enjoyed that. And I thought American government and politics because at that time, it was the city on the hill. It was the, the world's greatest democracy. And if you were concerned about democracy, then maybe there was something to learn from America. But I started to take some courses in international relations, and I had inspiring professors. And my fellowship was in, in arms control and uh, security issues, international security. And I saw a kind of nexus, and I'll end with that thought, which is that would democracy survive in times of intense kind of security turmoil, uh, whether internal security turmoil, as I suppose happened in Pakistan, leading to the end of democracy there, or other forms of internal turmoil, or in terms of uh, an enormous challenge externally under which you know, democracy might crumble. So I thought my, my worry was that, uh, and a connecting thread to my earlier interest in democracy was whether in India, uh, the discourse around security might lead to a point where democracy might be called into question. And uh, I thought the antagonism with Pakistan, particularly in the early 80s when I was there, and overlooking the possibilities of cooperation with Pakistan might someday lead to a situation where you know, democracy might come under stress in India. And so my PhD was on SARC, uh, an unlikely subject, the South Asian Association for Regional Cooperation, because I wanted to look at the prospects of cooperation in the region and how that might make in all the countries, it might be a part of a kind of democratic spirit that would, would flower in the region and undergird and strengthen democracy for the long term. I'm probably now reading back into it a bit too much and trying to make myself too clever about it and maybe too philosophical about it. But there was something like that that was brewing in me. And that's how my academic career sort of, of uh, flowered from there. So, you know, when we are young, we are filled with this intellectual excitement whenever we discover a new subject, especially when it comes to answering big questions about the world. So there is this allure of grand theories, right? Whether it's in economics or political science or whatever, you know, the first grand theory that you come across that is attractive and that explains everything in a coherent way. Doesn't matter if the explanations are true or false, because who knows at that time, but that uh, seems to offer a coherent uh, frame of looking at the world. One is tempted to adopt it. And then what happens is that over a period of time, you know, you kind of get mugged by reality. You begin to realize that none of the grand theories are necessarily 
you know the whole answer to anything as a friend of mine likes to say the quote goes all models are false but some models are uh, useful so what was that intellectual journey on your part like in terms of what were the theories that you were drawn towards uh, what frames did you feel had the greatest explanatory power and uh, earlier in this conversation you spoke about how uh, you had certainty about a lot of things in the 80s where you weren't afraid to express your opinion firmly but now your view is much more kind of nuanced so take me a little bit through your uh, personal intellectual development also of looking back at that time and saying that okay these are the things that attracted me then that i felt explained the world and this is how my frame has evolved over time and so on you know i was a bit stupid i don't think i uh, had a huge inter- coherent intellectual framework partly i think the way my political science training was was that it wasn't a high theory school uh, i think some of the the other departments were like that in, in you know the great schools of the east coast or the west coast of america but at illinois it wasn't such a high theory school and i think we we dealt more with kind of more uh, meso or micro theories and a lot of my kind of theoretical predilections were towards issues related to deterrence theory for instance which is the idea of how you with nuclear weapons or with conventional military weapons how can you prevent another country from attacking you that's a kind of a micro theory and i delved a lot into the logic of deterrence theory i knew a lot about civil military relations theory why coups happen why do militaries step into power and then uh, fail to relinquish power at some point for my thesis i i read a lot about regionalism why do countries come together particularly to cooperate at the regional level i had a whole argument about how we think about regions i mean regions are a bit seamless how is it that we draw a boundary around a region at a particular place more or less uh, you know again a, a kind of middle range theory i had i didn't have a big picture ir view of the world i mean your re- listeners may not be in this area but there are basically three big paradigms in international relations realism which is a power based understanding of the world liberalism which is that certain institutions and rules and norms out there like international law or, or diplomatic understandings and negotiations uh is what makes our our uh, the world between uh, nation states and the third is constructivism which is that we make our world there are certain kinds of deep values and identities we hold to that we construct periodically which have great power and you know it's those that affect how we think about other societies and our relationship with them but you know at that time i wasn't in that game i was in these middle range theories uh, in that sense I, i i was a bit stupid but in a sense i was a problem solver i was attracted to big theory i read a lot of sociology literary criticism i read the french theorists the derridas and the foucaults and the roland barthes and and all of that mostly so that i didn't look stupid it took quite a long time for that to settle in me to to help me make sense of the world better but i i had a kind of problem solving view of theory it would help me solve certain kinds of intellectual puzzles or concerns and not much more i think and uh, so that's where i was i mean i looked at problems that interested me and then i tried to turn to theories that i thought would explain that not very big theories but kind of intermediate theory so i didn't have a you know a very coherent picture uh, although deep down i suppose and i suppose that's true even now i was kind of a liberal i'm a liberal in domestic uh, politics probably and i'm a liberal internationally as well and i suppose there was always a substratum of that i just didn't quite know it uh, i didn't quite have the the language and the the profundity to to figure that out or even the self reflection um but i think uh, gradually that's where i ended up and i think something of what i learned uh, very imperfectly through these french theorists you know the post modernists and post structuralists and deconstructionists and so on came back to this kind of bifocal world view which is don't make too many big assumptions about there being certainties undergirding your world views there's no language game that produces a stable set of uh, assumptions and arguments for all time you can't derive an understanding of the world about everything once and for all from some olympian standpoint which 
uh, which you hold forever. And uh, so I guess I, I have a kind of um, shifting good humored liberalism, uh, again, a, a reflex against uh, holding to certainties in a very orthodox position. So I guess my meta theory is uh, don't have a, a, a firm theoretical base and be wedded to it for all time. So that's my governing theory. <laughs> So I, I'll just think aloud here and because I'm thinking aloud, what I say might be uh, somewhat naive, but then it's it, it seems to me that one could say that at the extremes, there are two kind of broad ways of figuring the world out. And one is that you have a grand theory and you make everything fit. And the other one is that you have no grand theories, but you get in the, uh, the nitty gritties of every problem. You solve one problem at a time and eventually whatever intermediate theories, as it were, emerge, emerge. And whatever grand theories are useful at a particular moment in time to explain something, are fine. And it seems to me that you would then have taken the second of these approaches, where you are not sort of guided by a particular uh, way of explaining the world, but you're just trying to figure small things out and seeing where they kind of lead you. So, you know, would this kind of be, therefore, uh, an accurate way of summing up the different approaches? And are these different approaches something that exists out of a thought experiment? That Are there people you can actually uh, look at? Maybe this ha ha ties into the fox and hedgehog uh, sort of description of Isaiah Berlin. Exactly. Exactly, I was going to say, yeah. Yeah, so so is it there within academics as well, for example? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I think, you know, as you were speaking and before you uttered those words, I was going to say, yeah, Isaiah Berlin, Hedgehog and the Fox, where the hedgehog knows only one thing if I get it right. And yeah. uh, the fox is slower, but it knows many things and it, it or it tries to know many things. And I guess I'm more a fox and I would wear that as a bit of a badge of honor. But again, the world needs both kinds of people. And uh, I just hate monocultures. And so we need hedgehogs and we need foxes. And uh, sometimes we need to be hedgehogs. And sometimes we need to be foxes. So even I wouldn't typify myself totally and forever as a fox. There are times when I've been a hedgehog. I mean, for, for some time in the 1980s, uh, 1990s particularly, I became a hedgehog. I was obsessed with the issue of India's nuclear weapons and deterrence, and that's all I cared about. And I got very argumentative and bolshy over it. I, I think I became a bit of a bore and, uh, you know, uh, I bored myself at some point. And I think things moved on, and quite rightly, and I had to go back to being uh, more of a fox. And I'm glad I did. And so, yeah, we need both kinds of people. And broadly, I think Berlin was right. You can, you can divide the world up into hedgehogs and foxes and your own persona. At times you're a hedgehog and times at a t other times you're a fox. And uh, I think that's fine. I think that's, that's good for the world. And again, thinking aloud, I wonder if the imperatives of the role that you give yourself actually shape you in one direction or the other. For example, if you're a TV expert, TV experts are supposed to have certainty about the world. So you would imagine a TV expert would be a hedgehog. Like Harry Truman, when he, when he was president, once said, give me a one-handed economist. And obviously the reason he said that was all his advisors were saying on the one hand this, on the other hand that. And he wanted a hedgehog that just tell me what to do. Tell me that this is the way to go. It, it strikes me that then there is this sort of dual impact imperative that on the one hand, as an academic, uh, you do want to have intellectual humility, not be tied down to any one idea and be a bit of a fox. But at the same time, as an academic, if you want your ideas to be part of the mainstream discourse, then you do want to be a bit of a public intellectual. But being a public intellectual, you'll gain as much visibility as as much as you can be of hedgehog because uh, people crave certainty. People don't uh, you know, crave nuance. So is that something that you've thought about? Or is that something that when you look around, you and you see public intellectuals or you followed their journeys as academics to a particular place. Do you see that kind of uh, sort of tussle happening within them? I do. I mean, and as I said, I mean, a society needs both kinds of people. Um, and so it's right and proper that there are those who are the hedgehogs and they have a very certain worldview. They express themselves very unambiguously. They tell us how we should proceed. And we need that in times of crises uh, and so on. And uh, they often lead us in, in whichever field, including uh, the political field. But as a check and balance, we need foxes. And I think that's important as well. And there are times when I've been a hedgehog. Uh, my children would probably say that uh, <laughs> I was too often at home. But And sometimes I'm impatient with myself. And I think, well, both in academic life and in public intellectual life, I should have been more of a fox. Or certainly my television experience forced me towards being a hedgehog. Uh, and sometimes my brother, who was in television, used to say, 
don't do this on the one hand, on the other hand, umming and eyeing. Uh, stick to a view. You've got 30 seconds before the anchor interrupts you, and there's no time for that. If you want to make an impact, be blunt. And I think there's place for that, and I tried to do it, but it was never quite me, I think. And I think there are people who read me that way. Uh, I did a, you know, an interview with a student of mine uh, who's now in Australia yesterday, and he said that you know a lot of former students of mine who were never very happy with my political stance in India thought that I was a dyed in the wool peacenik, liberal, secularist, and I couldn't listen to anyone else. I don't know. I mean, I I, I must have come across uh, like that, and some part of me is that that. Um, I do hold those values dear, and sometimes I do get on my horse and insist on that. But I think deep down, I'm, I'm willing to listen and adjust and, and think things through and, of course, be persuaded and, and so on that I'm not uh, the last word by any means, and I don't know all the answers. So I think that's important. And, um, you know, I mean, cometh the hour, cometh the man, cometh the hour, cometh the stance, uh, there are some times when you might just have to take a stand and take the risk of uh, holding to a, a hewing to a point of view and sticking to it. And you probably know that moment when it comes. And I think you have to rely on your instinct and uh, your uh, ratiocination at that point to tell you, here, I have to take a stand. Uh, there's nothing else. And I can't listen to too much nuance and, and all of that. I've just got to stand for something, but that can't be a permanent position, it seems to me. So I, I think I'll just let it wash over me. When I feel I absolutely have to take that stand, I will. Does that mean that I, I'm the person that you would always call up in a crisis or to sign a petition or to stand shoulder to shoulder on an issue and all of that? Uh, yes, no, maybe, I don't know. Uh, that's someone else's judgment. But I think more and more to myself, I'll have to take the risk of making those judgments as and when, you know, the moment comes. You know, and just again, thinking aloud, I'd say that, you know, the way I sort of determine this for myself is that when it comes to values, I'm a hedgehog. You know, there are certain things I believe in and I'm unequivocal and I have certainty of those and, you know, individual rights and personal autonomy and all of those things, whatever they are. But when it comes to facts, then I'm a fox. I'm willing to, you know, consider different interpretations and different versions of events and I'm always open. So I don't have one big theory that kind of explains the world. But when it comes to values, I do have a very clear idea of what I uh, stand for. We'll go in for a quick commercial break now. On the seen and the unseen, I often speak about positive sum games. Well, if you want to be surrounded by beauty and you love fine art, I have a win-win proposition for you. Head on over to IndianColors.com. Indian Colors licenses images of fine art from some of the best contemporary artists in India and adapts them to objects of everyday use like tote bags, pouches and home decor items. You get to surround yourself with the finest modern Indian art at affordable prices and artists get royalties for every product you buy. Win-win game. The Indian Colors new range is in and includes elegant yet comfortable dresses for women and casual shirts for men with standout motifs by artists such as Tanmoy Samanta, Manisha Gera Baswari, Shruti Nelson, Pradeep Mishra and Jaydeep Mehrotra. Stay home, but dress smart. And if you're missing your friends in these lockdown days, worry not. You can show them you're thinking of them by buying gifts for them from Indian Colors. Corporate gifting is also available. So head on over to IndianColors.com, there's colors with an OU and make art a part of your life. And hey, for a 15% discount, use the code UNSEEN. That's right. Unseen for 15% off at IndianColors.com. Welcome back to The Scene and the Unseen. I'm chatting with Kanti Bajpai about his superb book on India-China relations, India versus China. And uh, before we get to the book itself, which as I told you, I found very enlightening and lucid and I think everyone can really read it in one sitting, honestly, uh, which is a compliment, not a, a, a bad thing. Tell me about your interest in China per se. Like I followed the thread up to your, uh, you know, getting interested in international relations and, you know, beginning with, you know, looking at uh, civil-military relations and all of that. And, and I presume during this phase, you would have studied the 62 war and all of that. When did you really start looking at China closely and start sort of refining your prisms? And also this entire period when you've been an academic is a period of 
almost tectonic change in both China and India in in different ways. Where just so much has changed, and at the same time, how has the scholarship been changing? How has you know within the academic world, for example, is there a danger that there are fashions in terms of ways of looking at a particular subject or a subject area? How has that been evolving? When did you start getting into it? How did your thinking on it evolve as the years went by? Yeah, so you know, you pointed out that in the book uh, in 1962, uh, my dad was a diplomat in in London in the High Commission, and at the time of the war, it was sepulchral at home. It was uh, not that we talked about the war a lot. In fact, it was the opposite. There was just a kind of gloomy silence in cold London during those weeks, and. And so I think, you know, something like all Indians, the war has left a bit of a scar and a vestige in our, in our you know, memories and, and hearts. And I think the Chinese don't quite get it, uh, but it's there in, in most Indians, at least of the elite middle class uh, type of people. So I suppose it was there in me. And, um, but my focus, as I was explaining earlier, was really much more India, Pakistan and South Asia and the prospects of cooperation and the possibilities of conflict there. So China was not a big thing, although in the early 90s, I wrote some stuff on, well, two or three things happened. The first was somebody asked me to write on confidence building measures, uh, this idea that countries that were locked into conflict could, through some forms of communication and transparency, ensure that they didn't get into a scrap militarily, unwittingly that out of uncertainty and miscommunication, at least you wouldn't fight. And so military military talks, better diplomatic contacts, uh, arrangements like that would ensure that uh, it didn't happen unwittingly. So I wrote a piece on that, and uh, but again, drifted back to uh, South Asian issues, particularly the nuclear issue. But Abid Hussain actually, you know, uh, coming back to him, put it in my brain, uh, I think a little bit, that China had to be watched. He was very liberal, but he began to focus on this issue of India's economic reforms and how India had to get out of a Hindu rate of growth and so on. And, you know, this is the period of uh, 1992, 93. The economic reforms had just begun after the crisis. And he was looking at China and asking the question, how come they've done so well and India lagged behind? So talking to him and helping write some speeches and so on, um, my friend and colleague Varun Sani, who is now Vice Chancellor of Goa University, we were part of his little kitchen cabinet where we would uh, toss issues around and he was constantly talking about India's prospects and we would look sideways at China. And one time we were visited by a, quite a high level delegation of think tankers and academics from China. And what struck us there was how much more work on India there was in China uh, than there was in India about China. And I remember in the, the meeting there, in Hindi, uh, Abhidhu said, turned to me and he said, Are Babu, they've got so many people who have learned Hindi and Indian languages. Hamare kitne log honge? You know who can speak Mandarin? And I didn't know the answer quite, but I said, I don't know. I mean, uh, through the various programs, maybe we could get 20, 25 people outside of the diplomats who uh, had learned Mandarin in China. And he said, oh, I can't do this in front of me, kind of stuff. Uh, I'll have to fake the figure a bit, otherwise it'll look very embarrassing. So China was beginning to seep in, and he was always talking about you know, globalization and how China had taken advantage of it, and India had got left behind. And from that, Varun and I both began to think and write a little bit about you know, how India would begin to try and maybe catch up with China. What kind of growth rates would we need we didn't write a lot about it, but uh, here and there. And I think that thought stayed with me. And I, I think I wrote some pieces at that time, late 90s, middle 90s, about uh, the gap already with uh, China was beginning to be very significant. And what would be the implications of that? And then I think that went into cold storage. I went back to the nuclear tests and Pakistan and so on and so forth. And then when I finished Dune School, I went to Oxford. Instead of going back to JNU, I had a, an invitation to come to Singapore, but I chose to go to Oxford at that time. And there I found that a lot of the kind of excitement was over China and its rise in a way that I hadn't appreciated being at Dune School and, and you know, and dealing with South Asian issues so much. You know, China was in everyone's lips all the time uh, in a way that India certainly was not. And it just struck me then more and more 
And then another one of those phone calls came along. I got a call from my old friend Kishore Mehbubani, who had met at Harvard many years earlier at a conference on civilizational conflict, which Sam Huntington had organized. And he wrote the paper on Southeast Asia and civilization issues, and I wrote the paper on India. Anyway, he had asked me earlier whether I had wanted to come and teach at Singapore, at least for a couple of years, and I had chosen Oxford at that time. But, you know, he persisted. He said, you know, China is the big issue. Sitting here in Southeast Asia, we can see it even more clearly than you can see it sitting in Oxford. And by the way, this is the place to think about and study China and India, China. And why didn't you come here instead? And various things happened, and there's a story there. But uh, at some point, uh, that was part of the reason that I made the move to Singapore. And of course, once I made the move to Singapore, it was China, China, China. But also, very importantly, quite a lot of interest in India in a way that was not true oddly enough, in Oxford. Those two things came together, uh, and Kishore played a big part in sort of pushing me more in that direction of develop this idea of India-China relations, cooperation and uh, in, in the shadow of, of conflict. And I suppose that's what really then brewed and brewed. And I did various things here to take forward an India-China agenda, which I could talk about if you're interested. But in a way, that led up to the, the moment when I got that other phone call, which is from Nandini Mehta, on behalf of Chiki Sarkar to write this book on India-China relations. That, that's fascinating. I, I've just read one book by Kishore, which has a provocative title of Can Asians Think? I read it a couple of decades ago. And I noticed just now, but you know, I, I couldn't remember the name of the book that I've read. So I googled that and I noticed his latest book is called Has China Won? Which is also a provocative title. Good titles for books. Do tell me more about the India-China agent. I'm, I'm very curious. Like, first of all, to begin with, in Singapore, how different would uh, the gaze on China be? Because it's physically much closer, because I, I guess there is much greater access to insiders and to Chinese scholars and all of that. And uh, uh, how did your interest develop here? What are the areas you were looking at? This, this is quite fascinating. So do tell me more. Yeah, sorry. So one part of your earlier question I didn't answer, which was kind of the, the thought process about how to think about China academically and so on. So I, I think in certainly when I was at Oxford and earlier, the burden of scholarship was China's peaceful rise. And seemed to be going well. And uh, the idea was how to continue to bring China into kind of a liberal international order. And it, the prospects seemed quite good through trade. Uh, China was joining all these international institutions. And so the narrative was all good. I mean, there was uneasiness here and there and particular episodes where China was a bit more aggressive. But on the whole, there was a sense that, you know, uh, China was rising peacefully and would play a more or less responsible role. Um, but I think that uh, Singapore did partake of that. But Singapore's always had its weather vanes or antenna up and sensitive to other perspectives and possibilities. And I think Singapore certainly wants to ensure that exactly that happens, that China rises peacefully, it's accommodated appropriately, and that it is socialized into this more or less uh, rules-based liberal order. But it's always had a worry that that might not happen, that other countries might provoke China beyond a point, or that things might develop within China that would deflect us from that. So I think that I kind of followed that trajectory, which is I went from quite a complacent attitude towards where China was in the world. I mean, when I, I was charting this idea of China's growth and what it implied, it was more, uh, how could India reach those kinds of growth rates and catch up, but not from a very alarmist point of view, you know? And I think that fitted in with this kind of China rise thesis that was prevalent everywhere as well. There were lessons to be learned from China, and then China was to be accommodated in, in, a, in a correct way, not to be appeased, but to be accommodated where appropriate. I think in Singapore, there was already a sense that that might not quite work out. All, uh, and so one had to give thought to something else. But of course, Singapore itself very much needs and wants and hopes that uh, China will be peaceful and it will be accommodated in the right way. And it has friendships with the West and friendships with China, and uh, it tries to you know, reconcile that. So when I came here, I think I began to look a bit more at the arguments for why the rise may not be altogether peaceful. And 
uh, in the context of India-China, where I'd been a bit more complacent, I began to think that everything may not be necessarily quite so smooth. I mean, I came here in 2010, 2011, and already there were signs that things were sharpening, although the relationship was not where it is today, of course. I think, and, and a lot of my colleagues look at China issues, and there's a lively debate here on, on relations with China. And one of the things that Ch uh, Singapore deals with is that, of course, geographically, it's much more proximate to China. It's got a population that is 70% of Chinese ethnic origins, uh, 70 plus. So there's another kind of relationship to China that goes beyond just geopolitics. There's an economic relationship to China, which is very vital, as it is for everyone in Southeast Asia. So, you know, I mean, thinking about China here is a very different ball game. There are many other uh, factors at play here. And what that suggests is that it's not just the China rise story. When you're in a region like Southeast Asia, the connective tissues are ethnic, diasporic, cultural, historical, very profoundly. They are uh, questions of geography and the intimacies that come from that, which even a country you know, uh, as, uh, such as India may not quite have because it's got the Himalayas in between. And certainly the Western countries don't have that uh, kind of intimacy. So they look at China in a different kind of way. But this region must factor that in constantly when thinking about China. And uh, they have many deep institutional links over the last 20, 30 years with China through many international institutions, ASEAN, East Asia Summit, APEC, bilateral dialogues, uh, et cetera, et cetera, which India, at least until the last 10, 12 years, did not really have, and which some Western countries, most of them don't have, except for the United States. So I think that, you know, uh, there are many more lenses through which you look at China here in Southeast Asia. And perhaps that's why, you know, my book also has these four different P's uh, or lenses through which I, I look at India-China. The general ontology, you know, the broad way we think about a subject and its constituent parts. Uh, in this part of the world, it's a, it's a more uh, a pluralistic ontology of looking at China. Uh, and I think maybe some of that uh, filtered into my, into my book. So we'll come to your book in a moment, but a final question about this sort of field of India-China studies. Like it strikes me and I'm thinking aloud and you can tell me to what extent this would be true. One, a lot of policy of countries is shaped by elites in some way or the other. I mean, obviously, you know, politicians have incentives where, they, you know, where more and more they have to be populist and they have to think about what the people feel and popular sentiment and all of that. But a significant amount of it is shaped by elites in most countries. And that's number one. Number two, my premise would be that, therefore, academics like yourself and academics in all the places where you've taught and worked have some kind of influence. It's limited, but they have some kind of influence. They will often consult for governments. They'll have, uh, you know, entry points to talk to babus and sometimes some politicians and all of that is there. And the third thing that I'm then struck by is that whatever the extent of this elite shaping of public policy might be in, say, countries like the USA, which has a rich tradition of think tanks and parties feeding into the think tanks, and to a smaller extent in India, what is that extent in China? Because China, from the outside at least, seems to be an incredibly opaque system where, you know, the people in charge are not as accountable to the people uh, as in uh, these democracies. Though, as Manoj Keval Ramani enlightened me in a, a previous episode, that they do really care about what the people think and they're always trying to shape those narratives, but not in the same way as in India where there are elections all the time and so on. So how much of an influence are thinkers and academics uh, like yourself in even more of an ivory tower when it comes to the context of policy uh, within China than they would be in the US and India. And this seems kind of rambly. Again, I'm kind of thinking aloud, so excuse me if any of these are just, you know, wrong assumptions. No, I think uh, you've got a lot uh, that's spot on there. I mean, I mean, first of all, academics, uh, you know, I think we ourselves undermine our influence. But after all, we are the people who educated the people who run the country. We're the people who educate most of the elite because they all go to colleges and universities. All the journalists who shape opinion and the broadcasters all went through our hands. All the businessmen went through our hands. Uh, so I sometimes very puzzled by this notion that 
academics are lotus eaters, thumb suckers out there somewhere in some ivory tower. Uh, you know, and that's all. Uh, they're kind of useless people who that we sort of tolerate them. They have a profound impact on how we think about issues uh, because they train people, and then those people go out and shape the world uh, every day and shape wider opinion. So it seems to me, on that point, uh, academics everywhere, including in China. I mean, who in China has not been educated by an academic and the university structure there? So they're all products of that. And to that extent, I mean, their influence, the influence of academics is profound, lasting and uh, subtle. Uh, so I don't think we should ever undermine uh, that, that kind of uh, thought that they're important. I think in China, it would be a mistake to think that academics, public intellectuals, uh, even journalists and so on, uh, social media, you know, that it doesn't have an impact. It very much does. I mean, my, this is my instinct. I, I, I'm not a China specialist per se. I haven't lived there. I've visited uh, several times, of course. I talk to Chinese colleagues and uh, you just get a sort of a sense of it, you know, uh, reading their press and, and opinions and things like that. But And then I teach Chinese students. We have a good number of Chinese students in my classes and uh, and so on. I mean, it would be astonishing if uh, Chinese people were not influenced by their academics, their media, their social media. I mean, they would be the most amazing people on earth if, if, if they were more or less impervious to it, no matter how much the government tries to control it. Indeed, their elites, the Communist Party, their rulers would be amazing people, uh, like gods. And we know that even gods are influenced by human beings. So, uh, you know, I mean, I just begin with the presumption that they lend an ear, they're influenced by they can't separate themselves from the people and their thoughts. And I think they made it very clear over time that uh, they are affected by those pressures and imperatives and, you know, uh, what uh, ordinary Chinese people may be saying. And we know that at the micro level in government in China, local protests, the interaction with local people, uh, with the Communist Party and administration, I mean, they have an impact. Uh, and the Chinese Communist Party is extremely sensitive to what people out there think. I mean, they may not show it. Uh, they're not going to declare it, but they are extremely sensitive. And my instinct is that, particularly in India, this government is very, very attentive to how the Chinese Communist Party, as a party, has sent its influence and its kind of administrative, you know, tentacles to the smallest, most remote part of China. And those tentacles, uh, tentacles may not be quite the right word, but those arteries, I mean, they take ideas arterially out there and a, a certain number of ideas and, and perceptions come back up through the arteries. And I think uh, this government in India, particularly the BJP and uh, its various affiliates, uh, are quite intrigued by how well, in fact, there is this movement of ideas and uh, thoughts from the party down to the uh, micro level and back from the micro level in a constructive way to the, to the party. And I think there's something there. Uh, it would be amazing again if the Chinese Communist Party could you know, just sit up there at, on these Olymp Olympian heights, sending out fermans and diktats and and, and so on, and not bother to listen to anything that's out there. And that's not the history of Chinese political thought either. I think that um, there's much more going on at those levels, and the Chinese Communist Party is very attentive to it. And one of the difficulties, probably, in respect of India-China relations and dealing with, let's say, the border issue, is that today you don't have a magisterial personality like Mao or a super magisterial personality like Mao or even Deng Xiaoping who could swing a deal where China makes some significant concessions on the border with India in the way that they could have. I mean, Xi Jinping, for he is magisterial in some ways. And, you know, we hear every day about how he's taken control and he's a uh, president or general secretary for life and all that kind of stuff. But I wonder, he's not Deng Xiaoping and he's not Mao. And uh, he would... Uh, in, an, in a moment, if you could get him to really talk to you personally on the Amit Varma show like this, 
I think he would confess that he could not swing a deal necessarily as his predecessors, two or three of his predecessors could have. So I think there is an elite there. They can have an impact. And you know, the thing about the elite is they're like the middle class. They connect upwards, uh, sending ideas and feelings and perceptions up to the rulership, and they communicate downwards uh, from the uh, rulership to people below the elite, the masses, so-called ordinary folks. They're a vital element of a society, just like the middle classes. So they both shape and are shaped by uh, ideas. And uh, I have no doubt that the elite there is a very powerful force. That's a very interesting point about Xi and, you know, Modi not being able to sell concessions to their people because, uh, you know, in your book, you've mentioned Nehru and Mao and what magisterial personalities they are. But even there, you point out that in circa 57, 58 or something like that, Nehru tried to push through his cabinet the proposal that the Chinese be allowed open access to Aksai Chin so that they could, you know, get in and out of Tibet easily. And his cabinet didn't let it go through. So eventually they allowed that access only for civilian purposes. And that kind of remains a problem even now. So even back then, when these leaders were so strong and had the aura that they had, that there was a limit to how much they could get through. And and, and this seems a good time to kind of ask that meta question about, you know, the constraint that politics holds upon actually having meaningful action forward. Like you talk about elite influence now. China, obviously, everything you said is very illuminating for me because I don't know anything about China. But looking at India, I'm not sure it's true because none of the political class have actually been educated by academics uh, despite, uh, you know, a supreme leader having a degree in entire political science. And if there's any university whose ideas they have imbibed, it's really WhatsApp University. And I'm kind of being flippant here, but it is also kind of true that when you look at the underpinnings of the the things that drive these guys, I don't see any of that influence. For example, just today, and and we are recording this on, let me check the date on my computer, I'm so bad. It's uh, July 9th. And just today, Minakshi Lekhi, who's uh, the new Minister uh, of State for uh, External Affairs, has said, quote, some have expertise in making virus, some in making vaccines. Now, this is a very uh, jingoistic and incendiary thing to say and totally not on for an external affairs minister, for God's sake. This is not how we want to talk. And as you pointed out in the book, a lot of the Chinese attitudes towards us are shaped by what they see in our media and how they interpret it. And when they see a minister talking like this, that some make the virus, some make the vaccine, it, it's just completely out of line. But this seems to me to be shaped by a certain kind of jingoistic, nationalistic rhetoric, which is popular on WhatsApp, devoid of reality, something that no academic would support. And more more and more, you get the sense that our politicians can kind of drive themselves into a corner. Now, it is okay that we have a skirmish with Pakistan and, you know, our leaders can sell the narrative that we did a surgical strike where they basically bomb a few rocks. But when it comes to China, it's a whole different ball game. This kind of posturing can be extremely counterproductive and just takes us into the wrong direction and then it becomes like a vicious circle. So one, what would be your response to my counterpoint that, you know, uh, even if there is some academic influence on the way, say, bureaucrats may think, it's it's not there in politics and this, this force of domestic politics, this force of populism and this particular kind of nationalism so makes a lot of other things that we might talk about moot. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't want to suggest that, you know, Everyone has read their political science textbook or their economics textbook and then, you know, uh, really makes policy and uh, even constructs a worldview out of that necessarily and very easily. But it just does seem to me that, you know, uh, whether they acknowledge it or not, and sometimes they traduce what they learn. I mean, saying stupid things uh, despite your training is something that we've all done, uh, uh, including myself. Uh, I may know something intellectually and then I've made all kinds of foolish remarks. Uh, And I think politicians uh, are exactly like that as well. And of course, they may be more prone to display that because it might win them elections and, and, and so forth. But just still seems to me that at least a good part of what they mouth and so on has come from some branch of their training and, and thinking. And um, even what's mouthed on WhatsApp, has come from people who were educated at universities and high schools and and so forth. So, I mean, I guess I'm giving you a fairly prosaic answer, which is a literalist answer. Uh, 
that you know you went through school and college and so you picked up a vocabulary which then allows you to make certain kinds of assertions and arguments even on whatsapp and in political life which otherwise you couldn't possibly make but yeah i mean i, I suppose my sense is that uh, it it's true that a little learning is worse than none but on the whole i would bet on education university education in particular uh, still bringing us to a place of some moderation and thoughtfulness and and progressiveness and uh, i wouldn't want a world where that possibility didn't exist so it may be that leaders and elites or particularly political leaders are not as well schooled or as well educated as we academics would like and they ignore their own training or the best thoughts that we tried to communicate to them and instill in them but that's the world you know and we as academics ourselves in our personal or micro social existences don't always live by the thoughts that we espouse so i'm a bit more forgiving of politicians that way take nationalism i mean what else is nationalism but uh, you know a set of ideas that probably almost certainly were put together by sort of academics themselves first of all given the more kind of modern shape that that we today recognize as as nationalism if you trace the origins of nationalism to things like um the development of national languages i mean benedict anderson the the famous historian late historian in his book imagined communities talks about you know the the role of uh, the kind of nationalization of a language which is the dialects and so on were were uh, reduced and squeezed out and mass education began to teach a standardized script and grammar and language uh, and that's such a powerful kind of vehicle for nationalism it wasn't the only one the book is much more interesting than that but he does show that as other theorists of nationalists uh, and you know that was philologists and grammarians uh, who we would, we would call academics who did that so uh, ernest renard the historian said that you know nationalism becomes possible through forgetting and uh, historians are also part of this forgetting we uh, we band together as a people bec- by forgetting some of the terrible things our co-nationalists once did to us back in the day and i think historians play a role in that they help us contextualize something that happened back in the day we forget some of the hurt and anger that our forebears may have had uh, because we see what happened in some context which is kind of a forgetting we forget some part of the anger and and the resentment we feel because of this larger context within which certain decisions and episodes occurred and sometimes uh, historians tell us that certain episodes that we think were central uh, forget about them because actually that wasn't the biggest thing at that time so yeah i think uh, historians have had a very big role in fostering this nationalism as well i know we have historians in india i mean I, i'm not part of indian historiography and its study but a uh, very national historiated uh, historians both of the right wing and of the more uh, liberal left wing kind who are uh, very much how we see nationalism today came out of their writings so again i would say you know whether politicians understand it or not uh, they are mouthing the lines that academics have thought and you know i mean i guess it brings me to the larger point which is that academics have an enormous responsibility we can't keep criticizing politicians and lampooning them and caricaturing them because we have helped make those leaders uh it's our ideas that are being used out there misused by politicians and other influencers and we do have to be careful i think and perhaps the the best thing we can always do is uh, insist that you know uh well if not a hundred flowers bloom but a multiplicity of flowers are considered and in our pedagogy and in our classrooms at least convey that spirit of even if you don't agree with something altogether try and live that spirit of weighing up things and telling the other story and and all of that so i certainly wouldn't exculpate academics from the things that are going wrong yeah i mean i have a couple of thoughts here and one is about you you spoke about you know the importance of history and memory and at an individual level you know one of my big learnings about memory which i, I remember discussing also with anchal malhotra in an episode i did with her she's written this lovely book on partition of people remembering through objects that they've carried 
and it's a big tiyal learning for, about a memory for me because how memory apparently works is that when we remember an event the first time we remember an event we remember the event but the next time we remember it we remember the remembering of the event and so on in a case of chinese whispers in our brain which is why you know two people who shared the same experience can 10 years later remember it completely differently because each remembering it has altered a bit because of so many other factors and that seems to me to be the case in a sense with a collective memory also historical grievances that a lot of the grievances that we have that the mughals did this or so and so did this or so and so did that you know i don't even see why they should be relevant to us in the modern day but we have these simplistic history which then create these simplistic sort of grievances which feed into the things that we do today and the other aspect of it is the aspect of where academics are important in sort of keeping the uh, those dialogues and you know that nuance alive like you mentioned nationalism now in the last episode i recorded with pranay kotasane which is coming out after we are recording this so it's not out yet he spoke about how one of his favorite books is um, the gandhi tagore debates and uh, you have mentioned in your book and I'll, i'll i'll quote those lines where you write about how gandhi and tagore and one matter on which they agreed viewed nationalism where you have written quote especially for tagore and gandhi nationalism is both emancipatory from colonial rule and oppressive it encourages individuals to sacrifice their creativity and moral sense for the collective and to make excuses for social violence states built on nationalism are inevitable but for both tagore and gandhi individual self restraint and moral behavior are the key to peace and order if we all respected certain norms of behavior towards each other irrespective of nationality governments and states would become largely irrelevant stop quote and and this is sort of a broad you know, sort of view of nationalism which encompasses more than you know uh, our current narrow divisive uh, visions of it L- let's let's come to the book because um, otherwise uh, your publisher chiki will get extremely upset if we don't discuss a book at all so let's actually talk about this framework which i found so fascinating the four p's so tell me a bit about the four p's and you know, how did you arrive at the framework did it happen over a period of years or did you start thinking about this book and then you know, as you started not- making your notes this came to you how did it happen and then you know we can begin with the first of the piece maybe well it happened with her fifth p which is panic uh, so <laughs> i guess in conversation with jagannath i'd set myself such a a big list of things i was saying earlier you know we have water issues with china trade issues with china uh, our influence in third regions with china pakistan another p and the list was just getting bigger and bigger and i was getting more and more panicky because on some topics i thought oh my gosh i Uh, if i have to f- cover all of these first of all the length of the book how will i accommodate them but secondly yeah i'll either write some pablum another p something so boring that you know everyone knows already or you know i won't have enough to say and uh, some chapters will be humongous like the perimeters chapter which is about the border into where and in others i'll be muttering something for about four or five pages and then i'll be done and it'll look very odd the book will be imbalanced you know So out of that panic about oh my god and time was ticking so i think about 3 or 4 weeks into the book i began with what i knew already the perimeter the border issue that's where i started so i thought that would be chapter 1 turned out to be chapter 2 eventually and i thought the power chapter had to be done obviously weighing up the relative power of the two so those two were very clear so i started in the steve cohen mode just start writing don't think about it too much start getting stuff on paper So I started that way and then uh I had fingers crossed uh, that other things would fall by the wayside or fall into place as I went along and I guess in a way that's what happened out of that panic and beginning with what I knew slowly it dawned on me that the length of these chapters I was already getting to the halfway point of the book it didn't lend itself to too many more chapters so I had to start to squeeze down and then I began to sort of just play it backwards from what i knew to what i would declare to be a virtue which is you know what did i know best and what could i write about that would be most interesting to me and possibly to a reader uh, to what ought to be properly in the book uh, rather than some grand scheme and i just thought yeah something about the perceptions of the two societies towards each other uh, and because jagannath had said you're know, trying to infuse a bit of your own personal experiences into it I thought that's where the perceptions would come in. My trips there, sometimes a conversation with some Chinese people, 
or students or some visitors from China, I could resurrect some of those episodes. So I thought a perceptions chapter would get Juggernaut off my back there, where they would say, oh my God, don't just narrate all this third hand, but give us your first hand experience or some stuff. So that started to form itself as that chapter. And then obviously there's a geopolitical context in which India, China interact. And that was the partnerships chapter, the fourth P. And actually for myself, I think that's the least successful chapter of the book. I mean, that's the one that ought to be my bread and butter, India, China, Russia, Soviet Union, uh, USA. But I don't know, I found it the most difficult to write. And I think it's the least successful. I don't know. I almost think if I had it over, I would chuck it out. But um, you know, I I think that's a curse of knowledge speaking that you know the subject so well that you assume that you're stating the obvious and you're like, what is there? I'm just stating the obvious. But no, for a reader who doesn't know a lot of that, I would actually disagree. I'd say that, uh, no, it's a great chapter. All of it is good. Of course, the perimeter chapter is the longest, but I guess one needs to go into that kind of detail because they are the kind of concrete details that animate the relationship that we've had. Yeah. So for me, um, I uh, you know, you, you've almost framed your explanation of the book as if it is something, you know, you're responding to this from the publisher that from the publisher I will just assure my listeners that it doesn't read like that at all I would never have guessed that it feels very self-contained and um, just an excellent systematic building of a frame uh, to look at China but I'm sorry I interrupted you because I felt that I had to disagree with your pejorative view of your own excellent chapter Uh, do continue yeah so I think the one way of uh, saving that account that I just gave you this rather disjointed as it actually happens existential account is to maybe draw an analogy to personal life you know, why these four? So if you do that, I mean, the first thing you can say is that how we relate to another person is refracted or or affected by how we perceive each other. Uh, So we have some perceptions of each other that grow and chop and change and form themselves. And we can't even quite account for why we may think about people in certain ways. But that has a, a very powerful framing effect. So I think that's one justification for putting the perceptions chapter in there and putting it up front, a more kind of conceptual uh, way of talking about these four Ps. Although, I mean, drawing this uh, analogy to uh, individuals is not a very good way to think about social affairs, but it's one way of kind of just, you know, giving it some respectability, I think, and uh, communicating to uh, uh, your listeners about why these four are important. The second P is, is perimeters. So the analogy there in our personal lives is, of course, you know, to my neighbor, to others, you've got to respect my property, which is territory in geopolitics or international affairs, but my home and hearth, my belongings. I mean, if you try to steal them, if you try to break them, if you violate them, uh, we've got a fight on our hands here. And I will defend them to the death, presumably. So... Of course, perimeters matters because our property matters in personal life, and we will fight for those. The third P is partnership. So that's friendships. My friends' friends are my friends, my enemies' friends, maybe my enemies, my enemies' enemies, maybe my friends. That's true in personal life, I think. You know, at least it's the first clue or gesture. If uh, my friend introduces me to their friend, the chances are I'm going to be congenial towards them. If my enemy introduces me to their friend, I might look sideways and suspiciously at that third person, etc. So I think, again, partnerships are important and undergird that's, you know, they come from that sense that uh, our larger network of of sort of uh, connections has a role in whether we are friends with someone else or not. Um, And we learn from third parties. If we're friends with X and they say, why is a bad person and uh, why is my neighbor then I might suddenly start to look at Y in a jaundiced way because X who who has had some other experience of Y that he or she narrates to me and and so on. And the fourth is power. So of course, all our individual relationships are mediated by power uh, at some level, uh, some more than others. And again, the relationship between countries turns on relative power as well. So I mean, I would say that that's four more formal arguments if you'd accept the analogy to individuals and their relationships, that made me think that, you know, I was a bit uh, on a bit more solid ground. I wrote it not that way, uh, a bit more conceptually. And then my publisher said, this will bore everyone to tears, chuck it out. And I did. And I think they were right. Uh, 
But um, and that's why I dismissed other P's and other aspects of the relationship, such as water, such as Pakistan, such as influence in third regions and trade and so on. And I said, those are more effect than cause. So they become problems between India and Pakistan because of some fundamental conflict. It's not that they are the cause of the conflict. I don't think Pakistan caused the India-Pakistan conflict. It's that the China-India conflict caused Beijing to reach out to Pakistan, and that drew Pakistan into the India-China conflict uh, more and more. Um, so I think sometimes we, we are mixing up cause and effect. And of course, at some point, effect becomes cause in a further loop. Uh, so I don't deny that sometimes what Pakistan does with China then affects India-China relations. But to give the book a succinctness and a direction, I decided to go with these four Ps and, and um, just make it more readable for the ordinary reader. No, the four Ps, to my mind, do strike me as sort of a foundational frame to look at the relationship, as you correctly pointed out, Pakistan, whatever is happening, there is more effect than cause. And I love this uh, quote from your book where uh, you quote the former Prime Minister Yusuf Jelani talking about Pakistan's relationship with China. And he describes it as, quote, higher than mountains, deeper than the ocean, stronger than steel and sweeter than honey, stop quote, which is incredibly romantic. Let's move on to the first of the Ps now. Uh, your first chapter is called perceptions from regard to disdain and that does indeed seem to be the movement though it's a bit more nuanced and that of course it wasn't always regard and it isn't necessarily just disdain now but you know as you point out for about 15 years out of these 70 we had great relationships especially in the early 50s mid 50s hindi chini bhai bhai and uh, nehru overflowing with goodwill almost like mr jilani uh, towards china a and then it gradually began to go downhill, but you kind of go a little deeper into history, into the past, into the kind of interactions we've had through the centuries, which also I found very interesting because, you know, growing up what I've been taught in school or what is there in the popular literature, we know enough about India's, say, troubled history with those who colonized us and our history with, you know, those who invaded us or those who visited and so on. But China is just kind of mentioned in footnotes, you know, even though they are our immediate neighbor, like we'll, you know, know of Hyun Sang and Fahain and all that, which we'll read in our school books. So with a different spelling than the, the ones you've used, which I assume are more uh, authentic. Authentic, but we don't know much more about them. But actually, the truth is that uh, India, China have had, in terms of people to people contacts, pretty deep relationships for uh, centuries. So, can you, you know, briefly give me a sense of sort of this historical journey of the contacts we have and how they shaped our perceptions of each other? So, I think the story really begins with Buddhism. I mean, I'm sure there was contact before then, but I think most people begin the story there, and so did I. I mean, I'm not a historian of India, China, but just picking up the synthetic uh, material that's out there and rendering it for readers. So you begin with Buddhism, which actually probably, almost certainly, went from Central Asia to China first, not from India, as I think we sometimes think. And so it was indirectly from India, but not directly. Uh, the Indian influence comes later when, particularly, I think, Chinese pilgrims and monks and so on came to India to receive wisdom and to pick up texts and practices and take them back to China. And then some Indian monks and Buddhists went there to help translate and, and communicate and so on. So, uh, I mean, from that time forwards to roughly, I would say, the 10th century, very broadly, crudely, you could say that China had regard for India. And even there, as I, I try to show, China did have a sense of its own kind of importance and there were certainly segments in China, the elite, people around the court, who at various times reacted quite negatively to Buddhism. And in effect, you know, they were able to accept Buddhism by sinicizing it. I mean, so they weren't negative towards India necessarily, but they wanted to sinicize it. And there were elements that uh, claimed, you know, that uh, Buddhism was actually a Chinese religion originally, the Buddha was Chinese, etc., etc., that it was actually you know, uh, synonymous with Taoism and things like that. I think, n nonetheless, the broad story is that until about the 10th century or so, China had a regard for India through Buddhism. Uh, there was trade, there was other stuff going on, particularly in Buddhist relics and things like that, and in Chinese goods coming to India. But uh, it, it was born out of Buddhism and the learning associated with it and the practices. 
But at about that time, which is about a thousand of the Christian era, Buddhism was more or less ending in India. And, you know, Brahminism or whatever you want to call it uh, made a, a push back. And in a sense, I mean, I think this is what came out of one of the seminars I was in after the book. Buddhism became naturalized as a kind of part of Hinduism. So it didn't die in the sense that it was completely vanquished and obliterated. It just became a part of the pantheon of Hinduism. You know, uh, so you have uh, Buddhism as another god in the Hindu pantheon. Um, and so, but as a result of that, I think the Chinese pilgrimages to India and the looking up to India kind of began to die. If uh, China began to export Buddhism to parts of East Asia and even parts of Southeast Asia, and perhaps look for Buddhist uh, interactions and influences elsewhere and develop their own Buddhist thought. And by the 15th century, I would say, and somewhat earlier, the tables were turned, as it were, and in the parts of India uh, began to look up to China, to the Chinese court, the Chinese imperial domains, and parts of Malabar, southern India, where there was a lot of trade and, and where the great... Um, Chinese admiral uh, Cheng He visited. And before that, you know, um, the great Khan, I mean, there were kingdoms in Bengal that also were sending tribute to China. So, you know, I think the relationship was somewhat reversed. There are parts of India that began to look up to China and perhaps even to some extent fear China. And there was some interference by uh, the Cheng He's and so on in Indian affairs. And even going back to Harshvardhan's time in Northern India, there was a kind of Chinese uh, military expedition that was sent to India to take some amount of revenge and sort out uh, some of the affairs of some, you know, uh, at the time of Harshvardhan and so on, when some Chinese envoys had been humiliated and killed. So, you know, there was a kind of fear and respect for China at that point. Then there's a hiatus in a way. I mean, there was trade increasingly. There was contacts between Indians and Chinese in third regions, Southeast Asia, elsewhere. But a colonialism, Western colonialism arrived. And I think increasingly the relationship was mediated through the Portuguese, the Dutch, the, the, and, and, and increasingly by the, the British. The opium trade uh, began with, uh, between India and China. And out of that, and increasing colonial influence in China, the century of humiliation and all of that, the Chinese looked at India with two kind of jaundiced eyes. The first was, you know, they looked at Indians in China, uh, the policemen, the Indian troops that were being used by the British, some elements of Indian traders in China. Of course, the opium trade, which uh, clearly had a, a very bad effect in, uh, amongst a segment of Chinese people. You know, so that led them to a kind of negative perception of India and Indian society. And associated with that was the question amongst a group of Chinese reformists who were Republicans uh, mostly and were trying to reform China. And the question they asked was, and this is what I recount, um, you know, how come this great civilization west of China, uh, we think of China as a northern country, but they think of us as being in their west. Um, how had this great civilization fallen on hard times? Why did it fall to the British? And this was asked at a time when China was going under. So, you know, they wanted to figure out how such a big landmass, huge population, vibrant civilization had fallen to a handful of imperialists and remained under their jackboot. So uh, the answer they, they came up with was, in a way, a pretty familiar one, one that we tell ourselves in India. They didn't fight hard enough, the Indians. They were disunited. They had been riven by and developed a psychology of being disunited by waves of invasion. They were not able to mount a, a, you know, a, a united kind of response to invaders, that uh, different groups played out their animosities through these invaders, including the British, and they wanted to settle scores with other Indians rather than keep the foreigners out, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And one abiding image was India was a country of many castes and religions and hopelessly pluralistic and divided. And they were a kind of Luan people. Luan means sort of chaotic. There was no center there. And this society was therefore hopeless and could not mount an effective response. And China, there were signs that China could become that and it should never become India. So they drew a negative lesson from India that China should not become that. And that's 
not a very pretty picture of India. So by the late 19th century, their view of India was rather negative for all these reasons. And uh, and then fast forward, of course, you know, to the, the Nehruvian period and Mao and the Communist Party come to power. I think there were elements of that that still hung around. I mean, you're right that there was also an appreciation of India even now. Mao continued to famously say apparently that, you know, if a Chinese person was ever born again, they should be born Indian. It's some sort of quite well-known statement amongst the Chinese. So there was a kind of regard. And uh, of course, the admirers of Tagore and so on that uh, I mentioned in the book uh, had an admiration of India. And, and, and I don't want to deny all that. But I would say on the whole, you know, by the Nehruvian period and beyond, they began to be a kind of looking down the nose at India. And to tell, uh, tell the Indian side of the story, I mean, I guess uh, developed also, although I don't do enough of that in the book, uh, I just didn't have time and I don't have enough access to it. But also perhaps uh, both a regard for China that was there, but also in the modern period, a kind of negative view of China, partly racist through the, that we learned through the British and the Westerners. Uh, they were yellow people with sort of strange ways and, you know, consumed by drugs like opium and, and, and so on and so forth, or arrogant and warlike, again, learned from the West. You know, so I think uh, mutual disdain uh, was the story and elements of that remain the case. So a, a few aside from this historical journey, like one part I found fascinating was where you write about how when Buddhism first came to China, it wasn't entirely smooth. There was a little bit of friction in its acceptance and um, many people fought back because they said, you know, Taoism and Confucianism, they are our natural this thing. But then as Buddhism declined in India itself, they kind of uh, appropriated it and it just became like a third prong. And it's interesting that, you know, what you just mentioned here, I don't remember reading it in the book that they tried to paint the Buddhism as a religion that originated originated in China. We've kind of seen a similar thing in India where, for example, the wacky uh, quote-unquote historian P. N. Oak, uh, he would write about how Christianity originated in India and Jesus Christ was Indian and Christianity was originally called Krishna Niti. And uh, this is the same guy who, by the way, said the Taj Mahal was or originally Tejo Mahalaya. So I don't know, you know, whether this is, whether these ancient civilizations have this kind of inferiority complex that they need to make up these kind of stories to sort of make themselves feel better about the influences coming in. And speaking of influences coming in, uh, there's also a nice section on trade where you talk about the opium trade and you point out that we would give them opium and in, in return, one of the products that we would take is white sugar, which we therefore call chini. You know, Chini because Chini, fairly obvious. So all you Indian nationalists listening to this who feel glad that TikTok has been banned, kindly stop eating Chini also, which is actually good for the health. I mean, if you stop eating it, that'll be good for the health. So uh, that's one way that xenophobia may actually work for you. Now, the other interesting thing that strikes me with this disdain is and that, you know, you point out about how in the late 19th century, they lose the war to Japan. And uh, you write about how young reformers in China are now saying that, listen, we need to be more like Japan, Russia and Germany. And the country whose fate we need to avoid is India. And as you point out, an implication that the yellow races are as talented as the white, but not the case with other races. And you quote from this very interesting article, I think it's a 1906 article, a series of articles, which is called The Causes for the Demise of India. And uh, in that article, the author writes, quote, the word India is in fact nothing but a name from history. Aya, their land is all smashed to pieces. This brown race will be forever enslaved. Looking at China today, it is like India in the past. As a matter of principle, it were the Indians who brought about the demise of India. The character of the race is chaotic. Their language is topsy-turvy. Their religions all separate from each other. There is no unified spirit, no patriotic thinking. The elites are drowning themselves in song and dance and know nothing of great purpose. Alas! India is lost. Stop quote. And uh, later you point out a sort of a, a similar tendency when Tagore visits in 1924. And there are small groups of people who welcome him and give him the respect he deserves. But you also point out, quote, he was roundly denounced and ridiculed, particularly by leftist communist revolutionaries, old and young, including former ad admirers and translators. He was seen as extolling traditional feudal Asia and romanticizing the Orient against the material, industrial, Occident. 
stop quote and uh, later you quote ram guha quoting the chinese scholar wu chin hui and uh, forgive me if i get the pronunciation wrong where wu chin hui says of tagore quote mr tagore a petrified fossil of india's national past had retreated into the tearful eyes and dripping noses of the slave people as a conquered country seeking happiness in a future life squeaking like the hub of a wagon wheel that needs oil stop quote all of which lovely little snippets now m- my kind of question here is and we've also obviously at different times had sort of xenophobic views of them you talk about how a lot of chinese came to calcutta settled there especially in the bab bazar area the sort of frictions that would often be there but the other thing that i wonder about is how much are contemporary frictions or contemporary impressions shaped by things that happened in this distant past like do these sort of narratives that are there in the popular culture actually carry on as a kind of oral history from father to child and so on all the way down so that one generation will in some way without knowing it by osmosis replicate the attitude of like five generations ago or uh, do some narratives just naturally get lost to history and it is uh, the imperatives of a future time that they are perhaps revived in some way yeah i think that you know you're right to shine the light on this issue of whether uh, these uh, negative views and disdain and so on going back to the 19th century still really alive and and kicking in china and likewise whether elements of racism and so on on our side too and negative pictures of china persist from you know long ago or even whether the regard uh, uh, remains on both sides and still affects us i mean i suppose i, I, I think they do i mean that's the, the whole premise of the chapter in a way is that the something of that as a vestige at least uh, remains uh, some sort of collective consciousness is handed down from one generation to another and they they can be in very um, seemingly innocent uh, uh, popular remarks and things you know indian people are like this or chinese people are like that so there are these tropes that are out there even now you know um i mean very good natured chinese have said oh you indians are all so talkative and argumentative <laughs> to pick up sen's word about indians that's there from somewhere uh it may not necessarily be from you know uh received from or mediated through british influences after all they had their own popular kind of encounters with indians who were in china and likewise i mean uh indians uh, who had some contact with the chinese here and there might very well have uh, kind of concluded that the elements of of chinese culture that seem strange and not so nice i mean Uh, an extreme materialism is i i can't think i suppose a, a particular kind of trope or image that a lot of uh, people have towards china and i think there's an associated in india with a view that they're somehow very violent people um, and can be very cruel or uh, you know uh, despotic and i don't know quite where that comes from but maybe it came from uh, indians who were also involved in the trade in china might have run into troubles there or soldiers that served there and brought back some stories we know now from a recent uh, diary of course a, a different view i forget the name of the the diary that has been written by this indian sepoy which has now been translated and made available uh, which shows that actually there was a very great regard for his chinese hosts that he admired the ordinary chinese people and their struggles against colonials but yeah i mean i think overall uh, there's probably some basis for you know the kind of pictures we still have of each other and just like in personal psychology i mean you may be early in your life you receive certain kinds of clichés and prejudices from your parents and those around you but your own experience gradually as an adult uh, gives you some more and i suppose in the life of a nation that's true too so the 62 war the the terrible problems of the border the, the sense of mutual betrayal on tibet you know those kinds of things in turn has only amplified some original kinds of bad feelings on both sides over time so i you know the reason that chapter is there first is because i wanted to show that over time uh, we do have evidence of these kinds of uh, at least ambivalences on both sides uh, and you know one section of the book in the modern period i worked through three books uh, vikram seth's book of his travels through china you know it's Ch- chinese views of india through indian eyes so vikram seth looking at uh, 
interacting with Chinese people on his bus journey and all of that, and giving us a sense of how the Chinese look at India. And then this lady in Singapore who I met, Anurag Vishwanath, who over many years did research there, how she encountered Chinese people in China and sometimes how they looked at India. And then lastly, uh, Reshma Patil, the Hindustan Times correspondent in uh, Beijing, and this very nice book she wrote, also recounting many stories of how the Chinese people looked at India. So I use that section to show how even now, I mean, from the Vikram Seth's journey was in the early 80s or late 70s, through Anurag Vishwanath's journeys, which are through over many years up to a contemporary period, and then Reshma's uh, just seven, eight years ago, that there is a thread there of negative views of India, but also some approbatory or positive views of India. So this ambivalence, at least, is quite deeply there, you know. And uh, I don't have so much data on the Indian side, though I tell a few stories there. But I'm sure uh, that there's a research project waiting to be done there of uh, mining Indian uh, perceptions of China, even in the modern period after the 62 war, in novels or, you know, uh, commentary uh, and, and, and stories of individual kind of um, encounters with Chinese people that we could put together. Uh, my guess is that uh, both sides are at fault there, if that's the word. There are bad perceptions and some good perceptions on both sides. Yeah, and they come through in these books you mentioned, like in Vikram Seth's book uh, from Heaven Lake, he writes about how uh, he needed to get a permit to visit Tibet. And one thing that enabled that was he could, he discussed Avara with the Chinese official who was supposed to give him the permit because they were big fans of Bollywood. And similarly, in um, counter view to that is in Reshma's book, she writes about how, you know, she uh, sort of asks the Chinese broadcasting uh, executive, she meets about his views for of India. And uh, there are these two really pithy lines which uh, uh, say so much. Um, quote, children in India are naked, they piss on the streets, stop quote, which is such a succinct way of just, you know, putting the impression of a country. And then apparently he added, but all Indians have inner peace, <laughs> which is like a kind of a backhanded compliment. So I love these. And and of course, you, you know, uh, the, these three books contain kind of, I guess, impressionistic accounts. And you've presented a lot more systematic data on uh, uh, Chinese perceptions of India. There's Simon Shen's 2011 survey. There's a survey Shen did with Debashish Roy Chaudhary, where you wrote about their survey at a broad level, they found that the Indian media's coverage of military affairs is marked by shrill jingoism and distrust reflecting the paranoia at the heart of, of India's elite perceptions. The Chinese media is most sober because it is under the watchful eye of the government, but it has increased its coverage of India and feeds off what it reads in the Indian media to produce its own brand of self-righteous anxieties. Stop quote. And this kind of worried me because then you feel that this might be a vicious circle forming itself where, uh, you know, the jingo on each side is leading to increased reactive jingoism from the other side. The other fascinating part of this chapter, and, and there's much within this chapter alone that is fascinating, leave alone the rest of the book, is when you talk about the three Indian worldviews and the three Chinese worldviews. So would you like to briefly go through them? Because, you know, one of the conclusions that you later come to, and it struck me, is that out of all these six worldviews, the three Indian and the three Chinese, there is only one which, you know, can actually work for a positive future for all of us, and that is the least likely to happen. So just take us through these worldviews. Yeah, so uh, beginning with the Chinese, let's just begin there. I mean, I said they have three. I mean, obviously, there are probably more, but these are three big ones. The first is this idea of Tianxia, all under heaven, which is really the kind of view of China at the heart of the world and, and uh, certainly of Asia. Uh, and uh, mostly we know it as uh, the tributary system. China sits in the middle and there are all these smaller powers around it historically and uh, they send tribute to China. The tributary system had then China uh, give something back and generally it's accepted that the Chinese emperor gave back more than uh, he received uh, in the form of legitimacy to these smaller countries, sometimes interfering in their affairs to uh, you know, prop up uh, rulers who wanted his help. And of course, mostly opening up Chinese markets to their exports. Um, but this Tianxia system, if we go from that, then where is India in that worldview? Uh, India uh, is another potential tributary, basically. And now, uh, having said that, obviously, if uh, you're a Chinese looking at these tributaries around China, India is the biggest tributary by far. So, I mean, the Chinese are not foolish. 
certainly India, and this is a thought experiment. I mean, I haven't asked Chinese people this, but proceeding from this Tian Shia view, India would be the biggest of the tributaries and therefore it had to be given a certain kind of special position amongst the tributaries. It would be grander and deserving of a more respect and autonomy. But certainly all tributaries were in a subordinate position ultimately. So India appears there at best as a kind of junior partner. Then there's the kind of a communist worldview and the Republican worldview where, you know, this Tianxia and all that is thrown out. The empire is dismantled. The emperor is a uh, bid idea made into an ordinary human being. And what replaces it is communism and basically a Republican view, which is that people by merit will rule the country, either the Republican view of the Guomindang or the Communist Party. So there, I mean, again, you can see, let's just take the communists. Uh, the Chinese communists certainly thought that, you know, the great fight was with capitalism. Who would lead that fight? Well, the great centers of communism would enlist all the, uh, the minor socialist and like-minded oppressed people and lead the fight. And very quickly, Mao decided that so the Soviet Union under Khrushchev, he was a kind of, uh, you know, he was too weak and cowardly. And uh, the fallout with the Soviet Union at that time was that they were too cooperative with uh, the West. And therefore, it was actually China that would be the leading edge of the revolutionary struggle with ca uh, capitalism. Where would India appear in that? I mean, if the Chinese accepted, as some did, that eventually, not initially, that India could be a kind of ally, uh, that it was a sort of socialist aspiring country, that it was not altogether a, you know, a petty bourgeois or also ran, you know, a sort of running dog of uh, imperialism then India could be admitted again as a junior ideological partner and revolutionary partner of China. China would lead the struggle and provide leadership and backing to these minor powers. But India would not lead the struggle. <laughs> India might, more than some other centers of socialism and resistance, be a partner, but a junior partner. The third is, of course, as China exited communism mostly, uh, the third great uh, worldview is China's a great power. And there too, China now, the only peer it recognizes is the United States. And uh, if the China dream is correct, then uh, under Xi Jinping, then China will be not just the peer, it will be the superior. It will be the hegemon. It will be the greatest power on earth. And even the Americans will be in second place. So where is India in that? I mean, very charitably, the Indians hardly see India as a great power. Uh, at best, they sort of see it India as an aspiring power. Sometimes they call us an important power with a role in world affairs, very grudgingly. And even that's a kind of backhanded compliment. So in all three worldviews, India appears as a secondary junior partner at best, you know, and maybe even ignorable at worst. So the, the Indian worldviews, likewise, if we go from uh, this uh, sort of Mandala picture uh, from Kautilya, uh, well, there, I mean, China is a neighbor and your neighbor is your enemy and should be conquered. Uh, and then, you know, the, the, the uh, Vishwaguru or before that, the, uh, the Chakravartin keeps expanding and takes dharma to successive entities that it, it uh, conquers. But not even in the greatest Indian fantasy can one imagine Indian armies, even in the past, really, uh, traversing the Himalayas into the great flat plains of Tibet and then moving on and conquering China. So the Mandala system, the best that can be imagined is that India cultivates your neighbor's neighbors and they become your friends. But that doesn't work too well for India because if you follow the logic through, then the Russians should be our friends against the Chinese. But they've cut a deal with the Chinese, at least contemporaneously, and become the junior partners of the Chinese against the West, because their mandala is, or whatever their strategic, you know, kind of uh, system is, is that the West is the bigger problem. They look westwards. Their neighbor that's threatening is the West, and the Chinese are, you know, uh, the enemy's enemy, and so their friend. And India no longer really appears very important uh, to them.
So then Japan is a neighbor's neighbor, but Japan is separated from the great landmass of China by water. Uh, the stopping power of water prevents Japan playing a very big role on the landmass and can't help India out too much. So in the Mandala scheme, the only people who can help India uh, is by extension the West. And not surprisingly, America and the Western powers are our enemy's enemy who become our friends. But in all of that, you know, China does never appears as a friend. Then if you look at the uh, second worldview, which is the, the worldview of kind of uh, India uh, as um, f- from the perspective of cosmopolitanism. You see, I almost forgot my own book. In this cosmopolitan Nehruvian Tagore vision, see, that's the most soft-eyed, twinkly-eyed view of China as a fellow Asian civilization. It's a, a viewpoint where nationalism doesn't count for so much. In fact, nationalism beyond a point might be the problem. Then it's India looking at China through a different lens as a, another uh, a potential civilizational partner or another, par- another civilization that deserves respect that one can learn from, work with, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And that's a worldview that can accommodate China, that can look at China as a friend, as a kin, through softer eyes. But then we come to India's third worldview, which is our great power view. And actually, I, here I club Nehru and Golwalkar, you know, the RSS Supremo, in one bag because I don't think Gandhi and Tagore would have talked about India as a great power. That wasn't their kind of vocabulary. But Nehru partook of that uh, vocabulary. And Golwalkar uh, did as well. So in that worldview, then China is a rival. And it's not geography that makes China a rival. It's the fact, so that's, you know, that's a Mandala theory. But this great power view is that China's a rival because it's another great power. You see, uh, just uh, in that worldview, even the United States would be a challenge to India because it's another great power. So China from this great power view is that, well, great powers can never be really good friends. Although in Nehru, you know, you said earlier that he had this kind of a nice view of China and a romantic view, but he also always had a, a, a doubt and worry about China as of another great power. And some of his views are almost racist as well. And Golwalkar too, uh, you know, wrote sometimes about China in a very bad way. And the book that he wrote it in has, you know, you can't buy that book. It's been uh, taken away and hidden by the RSS and so on. So, you know, both of them uh, with their own great power view could not look at China as as anything but a a kind of a rival, although their view was slightly different about where the rivalry came from. So you're right, the only, out of these six worldviews, three Chinese and three Indian, the only nice one was the Gandhian Tagore one. Gandhi didn't know China that well, I think, just my sense of it. I don't know enough about his writings on China, but Tagore, of course, knew it it much better. And then, you know, he started China Bhavan and the whole uh, attempt to bring Chinese and Indian aesthetics and artists and writers and intellectuals together, you know, those were the only two who could really have a very nice, accommodative kin view of of China. And yet, as I point out, and you you reminded me, that those are the only two who today, where do those worldviews figure? I mean, there's the obvious, you know, October 2 view of Gandhi, which even the right wing plays up, but there's no great affection or you know, kind of partaking of Gandhian thought beyond a point in India anymore. I mean, it's an obligatory schoolboy view, father of the nation view, but not a real engagement with Gandhi and his values. And likewise, where is Tagore today? I mean, uh, and his thoughts about post-nationalism or uh, a worldview transcending nationalism. Again, sadly, I think probably really not there very much. Yeah, and it's it's very interesting that you should, uh, you know, talk of Nehru and Golwalkar in the same breath. Like I often say that, you know, Modi for all his rants against the Congress and the family is actually very Nehruvian in his top-down uh, vision of how the state should rule society and is very much like Indira in his unquenching will to power as it were and the desire to do anything to get there, that whole oppressiveness and authoritarianism that comes from him. But Nehru and Golwalkar is uh, an interesting uh, <laughs> sort of connection there in this context as well let's let's kind of talk about 
perimeters there and i found that chapter really fascinating and i have actually covered elements of it in previous episodes with manoj keval ramani hamsini hari arun and shivani mehta I've done a bunch of these episodes but nevertheless briefly give us a sense of what actually happens like at one point you talk about uh, i'll quote from your book because i found this a very illuminating paragraph to which kind of sums a, a lot of things up where you write quote in the 1950s both saw the other as insincere and stubborn in the border discussions they concluded that the other had failed to honor commitments in tibet and they came to regard the other as militarily aggressive and themselves as militarily defensive having said that now and then their differences on the border did narrow they agreed on the status of tibet in 1950 51 and 54 and they tried to avoid escalatory military actions so it seems to me that one at a level of where their posturing is that this belongs to us and that belongs to us there's absolutely no way that there is a common ground there that if you know one army is in x position which the other uh, country claims belongs to them it will be viewed as an act of aggression by one and as an act of defense by the other and there's no getting around that yet it seems for decades for large parts of our history there was a certain practicality about how far you can push these differences whether at aksai chain or arunachal or whatever and there weren't skirmishes in fact at one point there was a proposal of doing a kind of a swap so tell me a little bit more about sort of the arc of this relationship as regards to border differences and um, you know the possible reasons that it's kind of exploded uh, um, you know in in phases over the last decade like really coming to a head last year of course uh, in ladakh yeah the border issues uh, and the perimeters issue and i i call it perimeters just to stay with the peas but it's an interesting one because i think we've lost track of uh, that it began as a cooperative venture so definitely the two sides did begin a, pr- a process of negotiation and talks and it seemed to go fairly well for about 4 or 5 years until about 1954 and the issue of of the border cannot be divorced from tibet uh because obviously tibet is where india meets china and so it was intimately connected with the status of tibet as well and again the first 4 or 5 years brought cooperation on tibet india conceded that china basically owned tibet and uh concluded a treaty in 1954 and backed a certain agreement that the chinese had with the tibetans in 1950 51 as well so it began well you know one might have expected that uh things would get better and that was belied obviously and what i try to show in the book is as balanced uh, in, in as balanced a way as possible is that in a sense i mean it wasn't maliciousness and it wasn't point scoring and it wasn't you know a desire altogether to hurt the other side in those initial years i pointed out that there was a kind of a a, a split in the negotiating stance that they had there was the so called sooner school my term and the later school on both sides so my grandfather girja bajpai and kps menon shiv shankar menon's uh, grandfather as well they were two of the senior most uh, foreign service people and they were in the with uh, sardar patel they were in the sooner school negotiate with china because the chinese are going to raise the border issue and twin an, an agreement of the border to the status of tibet we will agree to chinese kind of so- sovereignty over tibet if they come to an accommodation on the border but panikar who was our ambassador the historian a uh, geopolitical thinker who was our ambassador in Beijing he uh, was of the later school he said don't raise the border issue because we won't agree and then we'll be forced to negotiate and we don't want to negotiate because in some ways our position in uh, c- uh, administrative control in uh, the furthest reaches particularly in nifa which is our natural pradesh today is very weak so we got to buy time uh, it'll come but let's let's wait for the chinese to raise it and nehru kind of oscillated between the two and then eventually came out on the side of panikar and the chinese uh, you see i think and i tried to show had exactly the same debate their tibetologists and their uh, cartographers came to the view that china that the indians were not playing fair the chinese had a case and they should raise it sooner rather than later and the politicos that is joined line mao and others in the communist party felt that the time wasn't right 
that China was too weak and they would deal with India later on this matter and not provoke. So the first five years from 1949 to 1954, they were both tiptoeing around the issue, both kind of expecting to join the issue at some point. And probably, uh, you know, they were still fairly friendly rhetorically and so on, and an accommodation might have been reached, but it, it wasn't. And then things got worse and worse. And But when they did begin to talk, and then I'll roll the movie forward faster, when they did begin to talk in about 1954, both sides did things or said things that could be prone to misinterpretation by the other side. You know, Nehru insisted on issuing some maps where Aksai Chin seemed to be very much within our territory. Uh, and he did this just uh, around the time of a meeting with Zhou Enlai. Uh, Zhou Enlai didn't take uh, umbrage, but as soon as he went back, the Chinese began to issue maps uh, of their own that contradicted that claim. And when India objected, the Chinese said, oh, no, no, these are the old Guo Mindang maps. Give us time. So we did stuff with maps that they didn't, that caused suspicion amongst them. They did stuff with maps that we thought was dishonest as well. Nehru was not even sure that we really had a strong case on Aksai Chin. And some of his advisors also didn't think so. It was really only when S. Gopal, the historian, went to Britain and looked at the archives there and came back that India began to feel that it had a much stronger case on Aksai Chin. And Nehru began to make much stronger statements publicly about owning Aksai Chin. And the Chinese went through something similar their records also had been disrupted by the civil war. At least that's a thought experiment that I do. Some records may have gone to Taipei, you know, when the Gomindang ran away with all those documents. Some may have been destroyed in the civil war. So they had to reconstruct their, their stance as well. So, you know, I give both sides a long rope in effect, saying let's not jump to this conclusion on both sides that the other was thoroughly dishonest and trying to out, outpoint the other. There were genuine administrative, political doubts, worries, weaknesses. Uh, they had come out, both had come out of a civil war. In India, the civil war was Congress Party and Muslim League. In China, it was Gomindang Communist Party, which was a literal civil war. It, they had both come out of a partition. Uh, after all, the creation of Taiwan is a partition. And Hong Kong was still there and Macau was still separate. They had both come out of a world war. They briefly fought on the same side against the Japanese, but... They both came out of a chaos of a world war, the Chinese particularly, because they were occupied. We were not occupied. They both came out of a period of war. We f were fighting the Pakistanis in 47, 48. They were fighting the Americans and South Koreans in, in Korea. Both were confronting the Cold War. So, you know, it's quite forgivable that they didn't know their minds altogether about the border themselves, each other, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. You know, so let's be a bit more forgiving of both sides and not jump to the conclusion they just wanted to screw each other. And that's what I try to reconstruct. But of course, they also did, unfortunately, read each other in a, a negative light. What might have been innocent prevarications, contradictions, hesitations, was seen as the other side as, you're trying to screw me and being dishonest with me uh, and fooling me. So not surprisingly, things increasingly fell apart. And that brings us to the swap, which I suppose was the last great moment when things could have been salvaged. And it's true, the Chinese under Zhou Enlai, when they, he came for that fateful summit in 1960 to Delhi, the Indians already knew that he was bringing a proposal like that. They weren't stupid. And this whole idea that Nehru and his advisor were naive, he was Chacha Nehru in his kind of slightly indulgent, benighted, faltering, foolish way. You know, he knew from the beginning, thanks to Panikkar, that there was a problem. Thanks to G.S. Bajpai, thanks to Patel. The letter that Patel wrote in 1950, just before he died, to Nehru alerting him was written by my grandfather, the draft, and then Patel uh, played around with it and sent it off. They were not naive at all. But, you know, there were other considerations. Anyway, uh, Joe and Lai arrives in Delhi, as the Indians expected, with the proposal. But Nehru and his advisors already had lost courage. Nehru said famously, which I quote in the book, if I go for the swap, I will not survive as a prime minister. And who are the people who would have been his biggest critics? The right-wing critics in his own party and the right-wing critics outside his party, the Jansang and others, 
but also perhaps the Swatantra party of Raja Gopalacharyan, who were more America inclined. And they turned out to be formidable forces, as Ram Guha shows in his work on, on this period. So they very quickly basically shut Joe and Lai down. And, you know, they had reasons. It wasn't just the domestic political sphere. They had concerns of, as I think R.K. Nehru said, or was it B.K. Nehru at that time? I forget. I, I'm forgetting my own book here. But and the foreign secretary of the time was saying, you know, in 1960, that if we give in to the Chinese now under pressure, because border incidents were already occurring, well, what's to stop the Chinese learning the lesson that if you push the Indians militarily, they will give again? So we get a swap, and then they go, oh, no, we actually uh, um, forgot we want some more territory, and then there's another set of border incidents, and there would be the expectation that the Indians would cave in again. And they also concluded that uh, Joe and I had never put anything down on paper. So this was a kind of chatty proposal. And uh, what was the, really the, would Mao go for it? Were there other forces? Or was this more or less a, a good-natured proposal by Joe and Lai, uh, slightly intended to smoke the Indians out and buy time? So there are all kinds of reasons that India could worry about the status of the proposals. I mean, the Chinese concluded from this episode that the Indians were simply not willing to, A, enter into discussion seriously. They were not going for a reasonable proposal. They were imperialists. They wanted to take over Tibet, et cetera, et cetera. And you just couldn't do business with them. Even so, there were still some attempts to, to try and deal with it, but it collapsed, partly with these military moves that occurred. And so, you know, the chapter shows that one period of proto-cooperation through a collapse into war, peaking in 62 occurred. And just to take very quickly the story forward, after 62, we go through almost a similar arc. Again, almost immediately in 63, 64, India sends out messages to try and get some talks going again. It has a certain amount of receptivity. An arc of cooperation begins, and it does well until uh, a much longer time scale here, uh, right up to about, I would say, the early 2000s. Maybe 2006 is the turning point when the Chinese ambassador in Delhi, very publicly at that time, says, by the way, we own all of Arunachal Pradesh, uh, so please, you Indians, don't forget it. And there was consternation because we hadn't heard that kind of blunt statement for the Chinese for a long time. And from 2006 onwards, then, you can see a deterioration in the relationship. By 2010, India, perhaps in, in reaction, stops making fulsome statements in the joint statements that you know happened with summits about, oh, yeah, yeah, uh, Tibet is yours. And so we stopped doing that. They keep insisting Arunachal is theirs. I mean, of course, they'd said it earlier, but there was a long period of time where they stopped insisting on it very publicly. That's 2010. 2013, we're almost uh, back to where we are now. You have the Depsang Plains uh, incident when Manmohan Singh is, is, is in his last year. That occurs just as Li Keqiang, the current premier, is coming to meet Manmohan Singh. 2014 is Chumar. Modi and Xi are sitting on a jhula in uh, Gandhinagar, and the troops are faced off in Chumar. 2015 is Bertsi. And this is an episode that people have sort of forgotten. Uh, I don't know why the Indian media has last, largely forgotten it. And uh, so 2013, 14, 15, annually, there are these fracases or confrontation. 2017 is Doklam, 73 days of staring each other in, in the face. And 2020 is Ladakh, back in the eastern sector with Chumar, Depsang, and, and uh, uh, Bertsi. So that's the arc. And that, so we didn't end up in the 62 war, we ended up in Ladakh 2020. It's an arc of cooperation through attempts to settle the issue. There were very thorough border talks from 1981 onwards. We've never stopped negotiating on the border after 1981, which people forget. But again, it degraded, and we went into near war in 2020. Uh, in 62, we went into war. So, you know, it's an odd thing that We've had two repeat cycles, and at the heart of it, I mean, I don't know ex exactly what the answer is, but fundamentally, there's an issue of trust there, which is a tautology. 
right? You don't cooperate because you don't trust, and you don't trust because you don't have a history of cooperation. So then, I mean, tautologies are useful because they make us ask, well, why don't you trust? How can I break out of this tautology? And here I would just end with some thoughts, which is, they're unprovable, but they're up for discussion, which is the political cultures of the two sides, really, in a sense, you've got liberal India working in constitutional ways, taking constitutional ways from the British and that whole mindset from internal negotiations to external negotiations of a certain kind. You know, they settled borders by treaty and customary understandings, and that's how you deal with the problem with China. That's Nehru. Whereas the Chinese, that's, they are two revolutionaries there, hard-bitten, cold-eyed men who went through cataclysmic total warfare. They are deal-makers. They're strategic-minded people. They think that the liberal adornments of law and constitution and all of that is some bourgeois idea, which is supposed to mask reality. After all, what does the middle class do in the capitalist? They pretend to give you all these freedoms and protections of the law to make sure that they actually come out on top. So they looked at this whole insistence on constitutionalism and negotiation and, and insistence on rule of law and treaties as trying to fool the Chinese. So, you know, they, they just couldn't quite comprehend where Nehru was coming from. And likewise, the Nehruvians thought that they were dishonest. And then, as I said, all these hesitations and cartographic kind of weaknesses that they had made the, each suspicious of the other. And that's just, you had a, both sides, ironically, were weak states. And weak states find it difficult to cooperate with each other because they can't convince the other that their moves are, you know. Then there's history. The two countries I try and point out are the two civilizations. Their two heartlands never had a very rich diplomatic history. They traded, monks went back and forth, et cetera, et cetera. But empire to empire, they didn't have a long history of knowing each other's ways, which could see them through. And what do they get from that history? They get predictability of how the other, but most important, they learn a lesson about, does the other side keep to commitments, i.e. promises? If you feel the other side keeps to promises, then you might begin to think, okay, if we did a struck a deal, they'll honor it. And the last point is, where does trust come from? It comes from, you know, if you're part of the same civilization or culture, you have a certain kind of sense of, I understand where you're coming from. We come from the same place kind of stuff. But for all that, China and India, you know, don't come from that place. They don't have that assurance or that immersion in a common culture. And so I think, you know, those are some reasons that they just, there was a lack of trust. And to some extent, all that continues to be the case. So your other two P's, of course, are about, like one is about partnerships, which is about how geopolitical considerations have kind of kept them on the opposite side with, you know, India will first go with Russia and then with the US and, you know, and all of these things ensure that they never end up on the same side. I mean, basically, like you point out, they're on the same side only once, which is in the Second World War. Otherwise, they're never on the same side of a conflict. And uh, your final chapter on power is about the great power imbalance, where China has become a much more powerful country and therefore China is saying we will not give any concessions because we are much more powerful and India which recognizes that it is not as powerful but it aspires to be will say we will not make any more concessions because you know it, all kinds of reasons it looks bad and uh, you know what would our voters say and all of that. I'll direct listeners to go and just buy the book and read it because it's a fantastic one sitting read and really I, I don't think we'll do justice to it if we try to really uh, summarize it but I'll end with a couple of final questions and one of them is this that it seems to me that post 1950s what has happened to our relationship is almost like this great tragedy where both countries for various reasons various reasons with uh, which are rational and understandable have somehow gotten locked into this antagonistic relationship where it has become impossible to trust the other side again for good reasons it's not as if there are any bad actors in this but uh, it becomes impossible to 
to trust the other side and which led to that one eruption of the 62 conflict. But what has happened since then is that both sides seem to have recognized that this is, you know, let's make a stable equilibrium out of this and not enter into any more skirmishes because war after all is a negative sum game and blah, blah, blah. So let's just ignore the problem and we'll make occasional noises and we'll posture occasionally, but we won't actually do anything against each other and let's just keep it as it is. And it's it kind of stays that way for decades. And yet, over the last few years, it seems to have exploded into a different kind of place where the Chinese clearly want something. And these these border disputes don't just seem to be about borders because, you know, I mean, these are, you know, Siachen is important for India, Aksai Chin is important for China, but they're not that important that you risk a full-fledged war or that you, you break this equilibrium. Also, the danger here is we enter a vicious cycle where we have jingoism on one side met by jingoism on the other side and it just escalates and becomes worse and worse. So, uh, the first of my two questions is that why is this thing happening? Why the sudden belligerence from them? Why have they kind of upped the game? What are the kind of um, competing theories and what seems most plausible to you? Well, I'll go back to these four Ps. I would investigate all four. But I think that, you know, in search of a fairly simple answer, uh, I would go for the simplest, which is that uh, it's the perimeters in Tibet, um, which is the... Chinese built a lot of infrastructure in Tibet, which is relatively easy to do because it's a plateau. And they did massive amounts of building there in the late 90s, early 2000s. India then, alarmed by this, suddenly started to get going on building its own infrastructure under the Manmohan Singh government first, a little bit under Vajpayee, and then again with Modi. So all three governments have played their role in pushing or playing catch up. The difficulty on the Indian side is that our roads are twisting, turning. We're going from the plains up in straight up into these massive hills. So our road building and infrastructure is much more difficult to do. And so it's not surprising that uh, it's slower. I mean, there are other reasons too. We were reluctant to build it earlier and so on and so forth. But so we've slowly started to catch up. We've rehabilitated some in our flatlands in Aksai Chin. We've rehabilitated some of the air, airfields going back to an earlier time, excuse me. And that has alarmed the Chinese as we've caught up. Now, we can say it's unfair because they did their infrastructure first. Why should they object to ours? But this is a strategic issue. There's no fairness issue here. <laughs> this is, again, you know, we're talking the fairness game. They're talking a strategic picture. And to understand what's strategic about it, which, again, we don't appreciate enough, probably on our side is, and I've been saying this in some of the other talks, is when you think the border issue, when you think conflict with China, please think Tibet. They are so super sensitive about Tibet in a way that we don't appreciate. You know, we think that, oh, we did that deal back in 54, that they should be happy with it. And that's the end of the story. No, there was a rebellion in Tibet after that, that they accused us of fostering and working with the Americans. And there's evidence that certainly the Americans very much pushed it. But beyond that, when you build these roads and infrastructure, I mean, they're reading that as not a defensive move, but potentially a move into Aksai Chin to again endanger their road from Xinjiang down into Tibet and to potentially at a moment of internal instability in Tibet. And I'll come to that in a minute, that India could play a role then. I mean, maybe not invade and take over, but cause significant trouble at the border and send a message to rebellions within Tibet, uh, which then the Chinese would have difficulty handling. So I think that's the thing that we have to keep in mind on the Indian side. And we're going into a dangerous period. So it's not just the roads per se. It's that for China, we're going into a dangerous period for them. What's that danger? Well, the Dalai Lama is a wonderful person, and I hope he lives for a very long time. But we know we're entering a period of transition. And he will depart this world, sadly, at some point. And then where are we? The Chinese will put up their successor. The overseas Chinese community, including very powerfully in India, will want to do their own succession planning and process. There may be Tibet diasporic communities in the West who will do their own search, which would not agree with either of the other two searches. So one can imagine a very difficult time if you put yourself in the place of Beijing, and strategic thinking, you have to think about how your adversary thinks about problems. So 
they can see a political strategic problem arising in the next 10, 15 years, may, uh, perhaps sooner, where the Tibet issue boils up, the Indians have completed their infrastructure and are much more able to intervene or cause trouble at the border, coincident with an internal rebellion and uncertainties. Um, and, you know, it may be that they would be generous towards us and say, whoever's ruling in Delhi would not, you know, deliberately stoke the problem, but would an Indian ruler, given public opinion in India, be able to handle the fallout of the succession and what it would mean with China? So from every point of view, they would be extremely worried about the Tibet problem. And that's the issue, you know, I think, which is that it's a bit incomprehensible to us that they're so substantially in charge of Tibet and all of that. What are they worried about? Why do they worry about the border? We can't invade them, etc. And as you said, the slices of territory that might be involved, barring Arunachal Pradesh, seem to be very small. But there's Tibet. There's their worry about Tibet. And this, I think, is, is the problem. And it's a, almost like a structural historical moment or a conjuncture that we've reached of the fatality of human beings, that the Delai will leave this world, sadly, current Dalai Lama, and a decision has to be made about the future of Buddhism in Tibet and the governing arrangements, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And the fatal problem, fatal meaning it's out of our hands, that there's a Tibetan community here who will want to have a say. Nothing in, not Beijing can't do anything about that existential reality. Delhi can't do anything about it. We're not going to force out the Tibetans. We're not going to put all the Tibetans in jail to, so we can avoid a problem with the Chinese. The Chinese can't, you know, do something about the Tibetans in India beyond a point, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So I think it's a, it's a real difficulty, and that may account for the very serious uh, kind of, you know, uh, problem that occurred last year. And you can see 2013, 14, 15, all in eastern Ladakh. Uh, 2017 is a bit different, but I mean, that's a different part of Tibet. Uh, you know, it's still Tibet. And by the way, the problem was in eastern Ladakh. But if, you know, going back to 62, Mao took a decision to hit India hardest in Nifa, in Arunachal, where India was probably strongest militarily, because he wanted to make the point that if we're going to hit India, we're going to teach them a lesson. You can't do it where they're weak because they'll find excuses saying, oh, they beat us up where we're weak. No, we're going to beat you up where you're strong to really make the point that, you know, we are angry with you. So th this may be, again, the problem. And the further issue is that they lay strong claim now, as they didn't as much back in the 60s to Arunachal. They may see economic resources in Arunachal that they didn't earlier, river waters, agricultural lands, minerals, uh, and all of that, timber. And it's symbolically important because coming back to Tibet, Tawang Monastery, that's there. They want it. We can't give it to them. Uh, when the next Delai comes, it will be in the mix of things that has to somehow, you know, that might play a role. So Arunachal is important from that point of view as well. And lastly, where are their main military headquarters? They're near Arunachal Pradesh. I mean, Lhasa and all of that is near, it's not an, in, in Ladakh. They're not <laughs> in eastern Ladakh. So the command headquarters are in Chengdu and, and neighboring areas like that. They only have one big command center, and that's in Hotan in Xinjiang, on, and that's quite a distance away from eastern Ladakh. So, I mean, a common sense of prediction would be that if there is a problem, we could have a, a very serious problem in Arunachal Pradesh because that's where their military strength and command strength is. So, you know, I'll cheat. Before asking my last question, I'll ask a follow-up question to this. You've been so patient with me, my God. Uh, so, and here's a follow-up question. The stakes are huge, right? If you look at it as a negative sum game, uh, as all conflict inevitably is, it can get just much worse and worse. And it doesn't matter how bad it gets for China, it'll get much worse for us. And we don't want conflict. And the positive sum game of cooperation and trade and all of that, the benefits are also incredibly huge. So now the question is that, what should India do now? Like, uh, 
going by this analysis that this is a problem these are their worries there's historically been distrust let's resolve it once and for all and let's kind of move ahead and let's do what it takes to resolve it what should india do now yeah i mean having said all this stuff so passionately uh, you put me on the spot which is a difficult one for academics particularly but uh, fair enough i mean you know uh the book doesn't answer the question really so uh because i got cowardly and and uh, <laughs> i ran out of energy and time you were more foxy than fejogi with this yeah exactly thanks <laughs> you put me in my place there in a way um but i guess that for me ultimately um at this point i would say there has to be a thorough excavation domestically on both sides and i think that unfortunately you know on the chinese side even if it happens we're not going to see it because they don't do that kind of stuff they don't open up in their system domestically let it all hang out and warts and all you see their debate and their mayor culpas but we can still do it because we're still open enough you know and uh, we still have a bit of a political culture i would say where we could open it up so i think that you know this is a difficult question uh, but probably for me the answer is that um Beijing and China are not going to carry out this internal somewhat public discussion which is probably necessary i mean they may do it internally and it could be effective but in a sense it, it can still happen in india more easily given our relatively open system and so you know it takes courage but i think india has to begin to vent to open to excavate to take a, a risk to open up its archives more maybe some things can't altogether be opened up but i see a, a kind of opening up already happening i mean you know there've been some very interesting books just recently sir our dalit singh's book i know you interviewed i think anand krishnan perhaps uh, i haven't spoken to anand but i've spoken to manoj kevalramani on his book smokeless war right and manoj's uh, work which i don't know yet actually yet so i must read that uh, thanks for alerting me to it again i know there are at least a couple of indian diplomats uh who are very soon going to come out with books their china you know uh, uh at least three of them very very high ranking in diplomats i'm not going to mention their names because i don't think it's my call to mention it when uh they still haven't come out very openly but you know in a way through them we are beginning to open it out in a way that we haven't done for a very long time and so i'm kind of still hopeful uh that these books will start to open it out and if my book also plays a bit of a role there you know in just uh provoking people then i think that would be mission accomplished so i think there's hope there and uh, this government and uh, shiv shankar menon and manmohan singh also began to open up the indian archives so i think that you know both these last two governments uh have played a role in encouraging that and i think uh, foreign minister jay shankar and modi himself uh, to their credit I think are sticking with it. Yeah, I think that's what's got to happen. If out of that debate then, you know, you see then it's not just Modi taking a case to the country. There's a whole range of people who will begin to open things up, talks like this and and other settings. The Indian elite and middle class will begin to access these debates. So by the time a Modi or his successor comes to really sort of go back to China with a possible deal, they will already be a a kind of civic society support base which will say all right we're kind of ready and i think that maybe already barring some real fanatics here and there there is a willingness now in india to kind of revisit the whole thing in, I, on the chinese side too i think there are constituencies there but i think it probably take india to kick start it at this point i know that's a hard one for us to swallow on because we think we've been wrong very badly by china including last year but from the spirit of your question uh leaving aside you know this episode and that episode and who was at fault altogether do we fundamentally want a resolution of this issue so that we can all move forward and deal with other problems i think from that much bigger strategic perspective i think we will have to take the lead in opening this up
Fascinating. I mean, I obviously don't know India-China relations remotely as well as experts like you do. But from the little that I know of Indian politics, somehow I'm a little less hopeful than you are. My my final question is this. Given that the stakes are so high, a lot can happen suddenly. You know, the world can change in a week as it were. If I ask you to look forward to say 2030, in the context of India-China relations, what's the best case scenario and what's the worst case scenario? Well, the best case is kind of this uh, increasing internal debate, that, uh, uh, which in a sense uh, was catalyzed by the events of last year. So if one could put it that way, the Chinese may have done us a favor by that. They may have catalyzed an internal debate that will culminate by 2030 in new perspectives in India. And, you know, I mean, I can't say I'm a big fan of this government, but uh, the chances are that Mr. Modi or a successor will be re-elected, and if they come back fairly strongly, they might be able to take uh, this change that is in motion in India. And it may be that if it's Mr. Modi himself, that he would see that as part of a legacy, you know. So to personalize the possibility, maybe that's the way it'll work out, is that he would take it forward. And by that time, who knows, Xi Jinping may also be looking at a legacy issue. And uh, they decide to do a uh, go for it, and it works. And we have catalyzed the debate enough internally that there'll be enough support for a Modi at that point. And so we, we get an agreement. Does that mean all quarrels will be over? No, but it means that at least this big one will be over. And then we can see whether we can adjust uh, other matters between us. The, the worst case is, of course, that, you know, that doesn't happen and things get worse. And the Chinese... You know, going back to what you uh, paraphrase nicely for me, just the gap between the two countries either remains substantially like this or gets worse. And if that happens, then the Chinese would be even less prone to, to concede to anything to us. And we would find it even more difficult to, you know, do a deal which wouldn't look like a surrender. And uh, who knows? I mean, uh, our nationalists, super nationalists and their super nationalists might just, uh, it might all explode. India might drift closer and closer to the United States to compensate for that power gap, uh, which will antagonize the Chinese even more. The Chinese will overread it and uh, something will happen here or there on the border and we, we could get into a serious problem. What might salvage it for India, of course, is that despite the disparity in power, geography, the Himalayas and, and so on will still play a role as a stopping uh, factor. And, you know, it, it may be another stalemate but it could be a fairly, it could be a little, a little war again. I mean, t- t- the optimistic part of that is 1962 war. We think of it as one month long, but it's actually only 11 days of fighting in two phases. And really for such a massive border, sad as any casualties are, the casualties were relatively low in the history of warfare. And that's probably going to be the case again, it seems to me, you know, unless people lose their heads completely on both sides. Um So I think that's the worst case scenario, that we do actually go beyond what happened last summer to an actual fight, maybe mostly centered on the Eastern sector. And that would be, you know, unpredictable exactly where it would go. But again, it would make the problem worse for another 20, 30 years. Yeah. And if other countries get drawn into it to some extent, then uh, it affects uh, Asia. It has Asia wide ramifications. Uh, But uh, I still remain somewhat optimistic that the events of, oddly enough, of last year may have catalyzed something, particularly on the Indian side, who knows how much on the Chinese side. And out of this, something uh, positive may come. And uh, we could... Now, uh, one last thought, on again, to personalize it, both Xi and Modi have shown that they can make dramatic moves, either in their internal politics or externally. In India, you know, demonetization, GST, uh, you know, certain kinds of other decisions that have been taken. Uh, One day, Modi flies to Pakistan to make peace in 2015. The next day, we do Balakot or whatever, uh, you know, uh, provoked by the Pakistanis. One day, there's Doklam. The next day, Modi is meeting Xi Jinping in uh, Wuhan and then Mamlapuram. The Chinese, likewise, uh, do all kinds of... One day is full warrior diplomacy. The next day, Xi Jinping is telling his diplomats, can you please ease back? and use less harsh language and and be nice, play nice. So, you know, we could see a dramatic reversal to Wuhan, the spirit of Wuhan and Mamlapuram uh, at a moment. And, you know, we have ambivalences about the relationship with the Americans. Uh, so you never know. It might turn on these leaders suddenly 
uh, making a switch strategically. I'm struck by the fact that even in your worst case scenario, it doesn't get too bad because of geography. As H.P. Lovecraft himself might have put it, the mountains of madness save Chinese tentacles from entering Indian arteries. And, you know, and but I'm also struck by the fact that some of the hope comes from the possibility of small men looking for big legacies. So who knows what will happen. But, you know, I've, I've learned so much by reading your book. I've learned so much by talking to you for almost four hours today. So thank you so much, Kanti, for your time and insights. Thank you very much. It's been a, a, a wonderful tour. Uh, I must say, revisiting my own life and learning from you. Uh, and I thoroughly enjoyed it. And thanks for talking about the book uh, as well. It's a wonderful forum that you have here. If you enjoyed listening to this episode, do head on over to your nearest bookstore, online or offline, and pick up India vs. China, Why They Are Not Friends by Kanti Bajpai. You can follow Kanti on Twitter at Bajpai Kanti, one word, and you can follow me at Amit Varma, A-M-I-T-V-A-R-M-A. You can browse past episodes of The Seen and the Unseen at seenunseen.in. Thank you for listening. Did you enjoy this episode of The Seen and the Unseen? If so, would you like to support the production of the show? You can go over to seenunseen.in slash support and contribute any amount you like to keep this podcast alive and kicking. Thank you.